Hey, welcome to the December 3rd, 2020 board meeting. My name is Greg Lippi. I'm president of the board. As we get started today, I remind everyone that the board is a consumer protection agency um, charged with regulating the practice of pharmacy. Public protection is the highest priority for the board. Before we convene, I advise all individuals observing or participating in the meeting that the meeting is being conducted consistent with the provisions of Gav Governor Gavin Newsom's Executive Order N-29-20. Participants watching the webcast will only be able to observe the meeting. Anyone interested in participating in the meeting must join the WebEx meeting. Information and instructions are posted on the board's website. I will announce when we are accepting public comment on the various issues and the moderator will open the lines as appropriate. I advise the meeting moderator to allot two minutes to each individual providing comments. This approach is necessary to facilitate this meeting and ensure the board has the opportunity to complete its necessary business, including consideration of petitions as included on the meeting agenda. I appreciate everyone's understanding and patience as we navigate this meeting format. Before we get started, uh, the moderator will provide general instructions. Moderator, please go ahead. Whoops, what happened? Uh, moderator, you want to provide the general instructions? Yes. Um, this is the this is the moderator meeting. Welcome to the pharmacy board meeting. Um, before we get started, I would like to remind board members and staff who are not speaking to please mute their microphone. Um, if I detect background noise during the meeting as a result of unmuted microphones, I will provide a brief friendly reminder or simply mute your microphone. Um, there are members of the public in the audience and meeting minutes are being taken, so I please ask that board members and staff identify themselves before speaking. To facilitate public comment today, we will be utilizing the WebEx question and answer feature. When the board president reaches an, a point in the agenda at which public comment is appropriate, public comment will be requested. At the board's direction, I will turn on and announce the opening of the Q&A feature. Members of the public can indicate that they would like to make a comment by clicking on the icon with a question mark within a square located at the bottom right hand corner of their WebEx screen. And those instructions will be shared on the screen each time for your reference. In the ask field, typically in the lower right hand corner of your WebEx screen, members of the public who wish to make a public comment will type, I would like to make a public comment and send to all panelists. Any other communication will not be responded to. Members of the public, it is not necessary to identify yourself in order to make a public comment. I will take comments in the order they are received and I will call on the member of the public and unmute their microphone. That member of the public will be given two minutes to make their comment and I'll provide a 10 second time warning. And at the conclusion, their microphone will be muted and we will move on to the next member of the public who has requested comment. Please note that the Q&A feature is being used only as a means for members of the public to represent that they would like to make a verbal comment. Once unmuted, that member of the public may verbally state their comment. This is not a means to ask questions of the moderator or members of the board, and such inquiries submitted using this feature will not be answered. If any attendees use a profane name, they will not be called upon to prevent members of the public from being subjected to profane language. While you are free to express criticism or negative views, for the sake of the members of the public participating on the call, please do not use profane language when making public comments to the board. If you do not have a microphone, please click on audio and video at the top of your screen, then select switch audio. If you need further assistance, please refer to that how to join DCA WebEx event guide that was provided with the board meeting link. And that concludes my uh, statements. Thank you. Thank you, moderator. As indicated on the agenda, the board will convene in closed session after deliberating on all the open session items except adjournment. Due to technological limitations, adjournment will not be broadcast. Adjournment will immediately follow closed session and there will be no other items of business discussed. I will now take a roll call to establish a quorum. Members, as I call your name, uh, please remember to unmute your line before speaking. I'm going to be taking roll call today based on alphabetical order uh, on your last name. So, Brian Brooks. I'm here, Mr. President. Thank you. Cheryl Butler. Uh, here. Thank you. Uh, Sung Oh. Here. 
Thank you, Jake Patel. Here. Thank you, Ricardo Sanchez. Remember to unmute, Ricardo. Oh, sorry, here. Thank you. Maria Sterpa. Here. Thank you. Uh, Debbie Veal. Here, can you hear me? Yes, okay. I can. Thank you. Albert Wong. I'm here. Thank you. Jason Weiss. Good morning, I'm here. Thank you, Jason. Good morning. Okay, we have established a quorum. The board will now entertain any public comments for items not on the agenda. To facilitate this portion of the meeting, as I previously announced, the moderator will open the phone lines for individuals to provide public comment. You are, as the moderator stated, you are not required to identify yourself, but you may do so. As we open the lines, I remind everyone that the board cannot take action on these items except to decide whether to place an item on a future agenda. Members, following review of the public comments for this agenda item, I will ask if any of you would like to place an item on a future agenda. Okay, moderator, let's open up for public comments. All right, this is the moderator and at the direction of the board, I have opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a public comment on this agenda item, please click on that icon with a question mark within a square located at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen. We're currently sharing instructions on the screen for your reference. And in the ask field, typically in the lower right hand corner of your WebEx screen, please type, I would like to make a public comment and send to all panelists. And as a reminder for those who are watching on the webcast, you have to be joined on the um, WebEx link um, in order to make a public comment. I'll now pause a moment to allow the public time to access the Q&A panel and submit their requests. Doesn't look like there are any, so let's close it up. All right, this is the moderator. Uh, the Q&A feature is now closed. Thank you. Okay, um, members, we haven't had any public comment, uh, but I'm gonna take a roll call anyway to see if any of you would like to place an item on uh, a future agenda. So I'll start again with Ryan Brooks. Uh, no. Okay, thank you. Cheryl Butler? No. Thank you. Sung Oh. No, no, I'm good. Okay, thank you. Ricardo Sanchez? Uh, yes. You know, do you want to place an item on a future agenda? Oh, no. Sorry. Okay, that's okay. Thank you. Maria Serpa? Nothing to add. Thank you. Debbie Veal? Nothing to add. Thank you. Albert Wong? Albert, is there anything you want to place on a future agenda? Remember to unmute. Uh, sorry, no. Okay, thank you. Jason Weiss? No. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, moderator, is Dr. Simonian ready? Uh, this is the moderator. It looks like we have her back in the meeting. Um, Dr. Simone, okay. if you could unmute yourself. Hi. Yeah, okay. I'm here. I'm. I'm gonna. I'm. I'm still on the same. Uh, uh, the same program. So I'm gonna see. I wasn't able to open up the Chrome before I closed this, and I was a little afraid to do that. <laughs> so okay. Let's see right. how it works. Okay. Well, I will now introduce you. Now I am pleased to introduce Dr. Jill Simonian to provide a presentation entitled Cannabis Therapeutics, High Time for Pharmacy Education. You may recall Dr. Simonian approached the board in January requesting the opportunity to provide a presentation to the board on the topic. Dr. Simonian is the course chair for Medical Cannabis Pharmacology and Therapeutics 
at the Skaggs School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences at UC San Diego. Previously, Dr. Simonian practiced at the VA Medical Center in San Diego as a clinical pharmacist, specializing in adverse drug reactions and medication safety. Dr. Simonian is currently involved with many national organizations, collaborating to promote cannabis education to healthcare professionals, in addition to advocating for the standardization of cannabis products and laboratory testing in an effort to best serve the public in a safe manner. Dr. Simonian, please proceed. Okay, thank you. All right, so I guess I have to change my slides now. Yes. Okay, great. Uh, well, thank you for the introduction and uh, thank you for inviting me to speak to you in front of the board today. I'm really grateful uh, for the opportunity to discuss this important topic and uh, open up this conversation. In January, when I did uh, approach the board to offer this uh, uh, presentation, it was mainly as a, an overview of cannabis in general and just to bring awareness to pharmacists. Uh, but since then, you know, so many things have happened, of course. But what's become glaringly apparent to me and other colleagues of mine is the enormous gap in cannabis use in our consumers and pharmacists' knowledge uh, in order to counsel them and the lack of education in our pharmacy schools. Uh, right now, there's consumers, there's, there's lots of consumers, uh, increased legalization, of course, and the, our consumers are now seeking advice in dispensaries from bud tenders, whereas I think they should be seeking advice from healthcare professionals. So today I do want to give you an overview of cannabis science and pharmacology so you have an, an idea of uh, what's out there. I'm going to try to limit that uh, so that it's not too detailed. I have more slides than I'll probably go over in detail, but I'd really like to uh, turn to the public safety aspect of this and emphasize the need for education of our pharmacists. And also I want to discuss the, uh, the CBD explosion. Uh, everybody knows about that and uh, the lack of standardization of labeling in particular and just the regulations that are involved in, in that industry. So this is just an overview of what I'm gonna talk about, a little bit about the history and botany of cannabis uh, the endocannabinoid system, the science of pharmacology, a little bit about the pharmacokinetics of cannabis. And I realized that not everybody is, um, has been trained as a pharmacist, so I'll try to uh, be as simple as I can for, um, for the rest of the audience. <clears throat> and then talk about the therapeutic uses, what uh, consumers are using cannabis for, and then really talking about public safety uh, the current laws and regulations and the implications for pharmacy uh, education and involvement. So here's just a brief history of cannabis, uh, the plant. Uh, it, it was, it's indigenous to Central and South Asia um, and ha has been used medicinally for uh, millennia to treat gout, rheumatism, malaria, nausea and vomiting, inflammation and pain. And I don't know, can you see my cursor? I'm not sure if you can see my cursor or not. Don't see the cursor. Okay, all right. Well, so up on the upper right-hand side, you can see the uh, uh, medicine jars that are all labeled cannabis. So it was definitely used for a long time as a medicine. Uh, on the bottom, you can see the emperor, Chinese emperor Shen Yang, who is chewing on a cannabis leaf, uh, presumably. And uh, he's the first one 5,000 years ago to cite cannabis as an herbal remedy and actually put it in the Chinese pharmacopoeia. And uh, it was in the US pharmacopoeia, as a matter of fact, from 1851 until 1942. And of course, hemp, the fiber itself, was used uh, for uh, uh, materials such as rope and clothing and the seeds of the plant for oil. Uh, the most well-known compounds are THC and CBD. And it wasn't until, believe it or not, 1960, when these two compounds, these two molecules were first uh, um, isolated by Raphael Machulam. And then not till the 1990s were the cannabinoid receptors in our bodies and the endocannabinoids discovered. <clears throat> so just in a nutshell, 
cannabis for a long time was used as a medicine very regularly and universally. And then in the 1900s, there's a lot of things that happened, including, of course, politics, greed, money, power, racism, and, and also the, the advent of synthetic medications. And, medicine, and cannabis was not a medicine anymore in the 1900s. And that basically shut down any type of research that could be done because it was put into the Schedule One status of the Controlled Substance Act. So it was very difficult to get a hold of and study. But things eased up uh, most likely because of the discovery of the endocannabinoid system in the late 1990, 1900s. And then um, more research was done and science showed that the uh, cannabis can have healing properties. And of course, money is always a factor. The definition of cannabinoids uh, technically is uh, molecules that directly or indirect, indirectly interact with cannabinoid receptors and modulate neurotransmitter signaling. There's two types of cannabinoids. There's phyto, meaning plant, uh, those come from the plant, and endo, meaning uh, body produced in the body. So <clears throat> starting with the phytocannabinoids, uh, these are naturally occurring biologically, um, biologically active chemical constituents of the cannabis plant. Uh, in the cannabis plant, there's over 122 cannabinoids that have been identified thus far. Of course, we know most about THC and CBD. Uh, we hear most about those. Uh, those are the most well-known. There are a lot of lesser known minor cannabinoids. Uh, but you can see these two molecules are uh, nearly identical. THC has a closed ring uh, at the bottom there, you can see, and CBD has an open ring. But aside from that, they are identical. Cannabinoids, phytocannabinoids um, come from the plant cannabis sativa. And you can see there, there's the flower up at the top. And uh, within that flower are what's called trichomes. And on the far right, you can see those little resinous hairs that are microscopic uh, in the um, unfertilized female plant in the flower. And that's where all the cannabinoids are stored, uh, including terpenoids and flavonoids. And, Terpenoids are uh, what the plant, uh, uh, the aroma uh, that you see it smell in any plant, not just the cannabis plant. And flavonoids are uh, pigments that the plant uses for coloration. So turning to endocannabinoids, those are the ones produced in our bodies and the molecules look very different from THC and CBD. However, they are still cannabinoids that interact with our endocannabinoid system that I'll describe uh, in a little bit. These are long chain uh, fatty acid lipids. They are lipid signaling mediators and they're retrograde. So that means backwards neurotransmitters. And I'll show you a little picture about how that works in a minute. Um, these are derived from arachidonic acid, uh, much like prostaglandins, thromboxanes and leukotrienes. The most well-known are uh, anandamide and 2-AG. And anandamide was, uh, like I said, these were discovered until the late 1900s. Anandamide was named by Raphael Matulam, who discovered it for the Sanskrit word uh, ananda, meaning bliss and or joy. So just a brief rundown on what the endocannabinoid system does and what it is. Uh, it's it's complicated. Obviously, it's very complicated. This is a um, this is a system that is found in all vertebrates and invertebrates, including uh, sea urchins and and leeches. Uh, and it is ubiquitous in our bodies, found in nearly every cell in our bodies. The main components are the receptors, the endocannabinoids, and the enzymes. So the receptors are cannabinoid. Uh, receptor 1 and cannabinoid receptor 2. Uh, cannabinoid receptor CB1 is found primarily in the central parts of our bodies. Uh, CB2 is considered a peripheral receptor and also has an immune component. The endocannabinoids, like I already said, that are the most well-known are anandamide and 2-AG. And the third component of this system are the enzymes that are responsible for the uh, synthesis of these endocannabinoids and their breakdown. The system can really be thought of as an adaptive response to stress to maintain homeostasis in our bodies. That's the main 
function of the system is to maintain homeostasis. And uh, Vincenzo Di Marzo coined the phrase, uh, eat, sleep, relax, forget, and protect. And the endocannabinoid system governs the physiologic processes involved with those activities. So here's a little diagram of how it works. Um, up at the top is our presynaptic nerve. Uh, down at the bottom is our postsynaptic nerve. And these communicate with each other to elicit a response. So what I have is the red dots are, uh, I, I, there's many neurotransmitters involved, but I just chose glutamate, which is an excitatory neuron. And uh, this excitatory neuron, as you can see, is fired down into the postsynaptic nerve to uh, exert an effect of some type. Uh, so it binds to the receptors, and then in response, the little green dots, which are anandamide, our bodies make and uh, shoot back up into the synapse to bind with the receptor up at the top and, um, and basically just puts the brakes on that excitatory neuron. So uh, that's a nice negative feedback loop because if uh, these excitatory neuro, uh, uh, neurotransmitters are left um, unchecked and present in excess, then that can perpetuate uh, different conditions like uh, pain, neuropathic pain, any type of pain, anxiety, seizures, et cetera. So how does the cannabis plant fit into all of this? Um, it, it, again, it's, uh, it's about homeostasis and balancing the cannabinoid receptors with endocannabinoids and phytocannabinoids happen to fit right into that system. And I'm not gonna get too much into cannabis pharmacology, but uh, like I said, I just wanna show you like the, the very main differences between THC and CBD even though they're a lot alike. THC is considered the intoxicating molecule of this plant. That's what gives the high um, that you hear about. CBD, on the other hand, is non-intoxicating. There is no high associated with uh, CBD. And uh, primarily because THC, um, as you can see there, it binds to the receptors as a partial agonist itself, uh, just as anandamide and 2-AG do. CBD, on the other hand, does not bind to those receptors directly, but instead works by increasing anandamide concentration and thereby allowing anandamide to really do its job. So back to that same pictorial, you can see the glutamate, the red dots that are released and exerting an effect and andamide is synthesized and released back into uh, the synapse in order to uh, put the brakes on. And you can see THC binds directly to that receptor, just like anandamide and mimics the same activity. Whereas CBD doesn't do that, it doesn't bind to that receptor, but it works by um, inhibiting the breakdown of anandamide so that there's more anandamide in, um, in the synapse and in the cell to act. So I'm really gonna kind of gloss over this part because this is long and involved topic, um, but I just wanna point out a couple of things, namely um, the differences, the, some general properties of THC and CBD, uh, namely, uh, you know, pharmacists of course are very interested in absorption, um, distribution, elimination, metabolism, duration of action. So I couldn't not put this in. Um, but I want to point out the two main uh, formulations that are used in cannabis and if that is inhaled and oral and or sublingual uh, formulations. Those are the most commonly used. Inhaled, just to be brief, the inhaled uh, is absorbed and acts within five to 10 minutes very fast, whereas oral and sublingual formulations uh, tend to be a little bit slower, so one to four hours anywhere between um, uh, oral and sublingual, and topically is not systemically absorbed to any degree, but can work on the uh, cannabinoid receptors in the epidermis and dermis, perhaps. That's not well studied yet. Duration of action, the inhaled lasts about two to four hours, oral sublingual about four to 12 hours. And if you look over on that, uh, that little graph that I have, uh, you can see the long dotted line, that's the inhaled, 
acts very quickly and tapers off after about four hours, whereas the oral formulations really don't start working until at least 30 minutes, one hour, peaking anywhere between two and four and lasting quite a bit longer, has a delayed and lower peak level. These compounds are widely distributed into tissues because they are lipophilic, fat-loving, and that confers a very long half-life for both of these products. <clears throat> Metabolism is uh, always a critical factor, and um, there, there's, this is also another complicated um, subject, but I just want you to know that this, these, uh, these compounds, THC and CBD, both utilize the cytochrome P450 enzyme system, which is the most prominent me metabolism pathway for uh, up to 90% of all drugs, actually. These two molecules uh, go through extensive gut and liver metabolism, um, reducing their bioavailability when taking orally. So you can see these oral formulations, oral and sublingual, <clears throat> and I put sublingual, you know, t together with oral because although sublingual can be absorbed through the mucous membranes, a lot of it is swallowed. So I sort of put those together because they uh, fall into the same category at some level. There is oral and these oral formulations are subject to a higher liver and gut metabolism because you have to swallow them. They go through the gut. They have to be absorbed then they have to be carried through the liver via the portal vein before they reach the uh, central um, circulation. So there's reduced bioavailability because of this extensive metabolism. And also there's food effects that, um, that can have a, um, an issue. In fact, um, food, a high fat diet has been shown to increase uh, the concentration and the bioavailability of both of these compounds and also uh, um, uh, it, it, there's a delayed onset when it's taken with food. So these are things that pharmacists need to know in order to talk to their patients and I think the information has not really um, is not well known. Importantly THC uh, when taken oral is metabolized to an active metabolite. And that's important because um, once you take something orally, THC in particular, CBD doesn't have any active metabolites that are known um, so far, but THC is metabolized to 11-hydroxy THC, which is at least as active, if not more active than THC. So when you take it orally, you not only have the parent THC that causes a high or exerts an effect, but you have the metabolite that's doing the same thing. And of course, metabolism um, is related to potential drug interactions, so these uh, need to be noted. Just briefly about drug interactions, um, just to start with, there's, there are very few actual documented drug interactions. And, but you know, when you're considering whether something is at risk of a drug interaction, um, the first thing you want to think about is their uh, uh, metabolic pathway in the liver. And so any drug that potentially use, uh, utilizes the same system that THC and CBD uses, which is the cytochrome P450 system, uh, there is a potential for a drug interaction. But there's a lot of other considerations, including gene polymorphisms, there's uh, genotype variability, person to person and some people exhibit fast or slow metabolism. Uh, doses used are important. High doses may overwhelm the system more than low doses. And of course, liver function is, um, is something to consider as well because liver insufficiency may uh, lead to a, a different metabolism. <clears throat> so examples of drugs that use the same uh, metabolic pathway as THC and CBD as you can see, uh, this is just a really minor list because the list could take up five pages, uh, but anticonvulsants, SSRIs, so uh, our primary antidepressants that we use, anticoagulants, macrolide antibiotics, such as erythromycin and benzodiazepines. And there are, like I said, very few documented reactions. But I will tell you the ones that have been documented, uh, 
And they're, like I said, they're few, but um, you can see over on the left-hand side, uh, because CBD is an inhibitor of, an, of the enzymes, uh, uh, clobazam, which is on fee, uh, uh, nor clobazam, which is its metabolite, and steropental, these are all anticonvulsants, and uh, CBD has been shown to increase those levels. Um, it, and there are also uh, a handful of case reports of CBD increasing the INR in a patient uh, taking warfarin and THC as well. Uh, there's a couple of case reports about INR increasing in patients taking warfarin and using cannabis products. So just to go back, um, if there is a concern or uh, you think there's a high risk of, of a drug interaction, of course, uh, if the drug has a narrow therapeutic index, it's just prudent to take blood levels in order to monitor that. So aside from drug-drug interactions, there's also pharmacodynamic interactions, <clears throat> liver toxicity being one, there's uh, some um, some report of CBD and valproate together increasing LFTs in a reversible fashion. And that's still not completely well proven yet, but any drug that um, may cause increased LFTs, concomitant use, doses used again, high, high doses matter more than low doses and liver function is another thing to take into consideration. <clears throat> Probably more importantly right now, is the compounded CNS effects when using THC in combination with other sedative drugs, uh, because we, uh, we know THC causes sedation and some cognitive impairment. Uh, so in combination with opioids, alcohol, benzos, uh, gab gabapentin, or any other drug that causes sedation, we'd wanna be careful with and um, counsel a patient about. So turning to therapeutic uses and what patients are using it for, it's obvious that there, there is a much increased use of cannabis in consumers in general. And in particular with our seniors, they are seeking it out for all kinds of conditions, which I'll show you. And that's our highest um, growing user, consumer users right now. And what they're using it for is primarily uh, patients are seeking cannabis for pain, and that's chronic musculoskeletal pain, cancer pain, inflammatory pain, neuropathic or nerve pain, <clears throat> as well as anxiety, sleep, spasticity, um, and multiple sclerosis. There's actually a drug in the UK that's a THC CBD compound that has been used for quite some time, not here in the US. Um, and there's a lot of research about whether this can be an opioid sparing drug and, uh, and, and perhaps could mitigate um, uh, the opioid use in our public for especially pain. This is a study from the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine. This is a non-governmental institution that formed a committee of experts which was tasked to review all the evidence-based literature on health effects of cannabis-based products between 1999 and 2016. And this report was published in 2017, uh, and it was is quite large, uh, 440 pages. And this is what they found. There's conclusive or substantial evidence that cannabis and cannabinoids can be used are effective for the treatment of chronic pain as antiemetics in the treatment of chemotherapy induced nausea and vomiting for multiple sclerosis, like I've already mentioned. And there's moderate evidence that cannabis or cannabinoids are effective for short, short term sleep outcomes, which is what our consumers are seeking it out for. So turning over to the public safety, uh, I've already talked about, here's the components that we think about in public safety, dosing, uh, therapeutics, what people are using it for, what the dosing, and I didn't really get into the dosing too much because uh, dosing cannabis is extremely individualized and complicated 
uh, not not clear. So that would be a whole nother topic. So I didn't talk about that right now, but um, I talked about the potential drug interactions. And of course, we're concerned about adverse drug reactions. And, um, and then I want to uh, go back to the products. Uh, this is particularly CBD products and the standardization or lack thereof um, of these products that are sold everywhere. So the, uh, the main side effects of THC, uh, no surprise, it causes a, a high, we know that. Uh, so impaired cognition, sedation, dizziness is what uh, the more of the elderly um, consumers are reporting as their biggest side effect, headache, uh, cough with uh, inhaled products, smoking particularly, and of course impaired driving we always need to be concerned about. Tachycardia and orthostatic hypotension uh, can occur, but that's rare and with high doses and acute psychosis is also reported again with high doses and in particular Acute psychosis happens with oral products because, like I said, uh, the onset of action is quite a bit later than the inhaled. And so people can seem to take more and more, you know, half an hour, they're not feeling anything. So they take another one and then an hour. And then um, and then by then they've they've taken more than they should. And so that's what the uh, acute psychosis where you get that. CBD is uh, very well tolerated actually with a uh, few side effects, including diarrhea, GI effects in general, and sedation at high doses. And it appears that uh, uh, CBD is more alerting at low doses, but uh, sedating at higher doses. And like I, I already talked about the liver toxicity, that's unlikely. Um, but the biggest factor here is there's no fatal dose of these drugs, and that's very important. So the CDC reports on the prevalence of illicit drug use and prescription misuse in the past uh, in the past year. This this report was in the past year, which was 2016, uh, published in 2018. And as you can see here, the um, this is self-reported drug use. So marijuana, heroin, opiates, uh, cocaine, methamphetamine, and and if you look at the marijuana on the far left, it's 13.9 percent. Uh, which is much higher than heroin, 0.4%, uh, prescription pain meds, 4.4, et cetera. You can see that they, there's a higher than the higher self-reported use of marijuana than the other medications. And yet when they, in the same report, when they report drug overdose deaths, you could see here that prescription opiates are on the rise. We, everybody knows that. Um, uh, the blue line here is synthetic opiates, which is rising at a frightening rate. Uh, that's the synthetic fentanyl that we're seeing laced in um, products that are sold at the black market. Um, and in fact, uh, in, in 2018, opiates killed 47,000 people by overdose, and 32% uh, of those were prescription drugs. But what's missing here is a line for cannabis and there, there, because there isn't one, there was no reported um, uh, overdose deaths due to cannabis. And in fact, the CDC goes further to say that a fatal overdose is unlikely. And of course, that doesn't mean that marijuana is harmless. We all know that. We need to counsel our patients about the side effects that can happen. <laughs> and this is, uh, this is a slide that I stole from uh, one of my uh, colleagues, Jehan Marku, thank you. Um, just showing, I just love the pictorial of this, of how heroin, the, uh, the amount of heroin that's fatal compared with fentanyl, that's really scary, compared with the fatal dose of marijuana. And, and fatal is the incorrect word there because not even this is fatal unless it hits you on the head, I guess. So let's go to product standardization because this is really important. Uh, the CBD products are being sold everywhere. We know that, uh, we see them everywhere. So how do we decide uh, the legitimacy of these? And I'll start with the FDA approved products that we have. So 
over on the far uh, left on the top is Marinol, which is Dranabinol. That's a synthetic THC that's uh, schedule three. Uh, to the right in the middle is Syndros, which is also Dranabinol, same drug, synthetic THC in an oral dosage form. To the far right is uh, uh, Sesamet, which is Nabilone. That's a synthetic THC analog, not the same molecular structure as THC. That's off market now. And on the bottom is Epidiolex. Now, Epidiolex is the newest one to be uh, approved by the FDA. That was approved in 2018. It's the first whole plant cannabidiol uh, product that the FDA has approved. Uh, it's approved for use in a couple of rare forms of seizure disorders, mostly found in children. And this is an oral form, like I said. It was originally given a Schedule Five status uh, when it was approved, but it, it has subsequently been descheduled, so it's not controlled at all by the um, by the DEA. On the far left, on the far right, I just want to show you the Sativex. That's the available in the UK and other countries. This is a whole plant THC CBD combination, which is an oral mucosal spray. So I, I just want to give you a couple of vocabulary words, uh, whole plant versus isolate. So just in general, whole plant is you take this whole plant over on the left, uh, you put it through the extraction device, you get a crude oil and it has everything in the oil, that uh, in the plant, in the oil. So that's cannabinoids, terpenoids, chlorophyll, the whole gambit. You can distill that further and separate out each different component. Um, and then uh, eventually you get to what's on the right side is just an isolate with only one of those molecules. <clears throat> and I just wanted to show you some of the vocabulary that's used because I'm gonna give you some examples. Um, and full spectrum on the left is, like I said, everything in the plant, CBD, THC, minor cannabinoids, et cetera. In the middle is broad spectrum, and that's everything in the plant except THC. They isolate that out. And then if you go further to the right, that's just the CBD isolate, and that's CBD only. <clears throat> the... The FDA is commissioned to conduct a sampling study of uh, current CBD marketplace uh, products to determine the extent of products that are mislabeled uh, and or adulterated. And so what they did is in 2020, they uh, began this, uh, this particular study and they started with 200 products uh, to test and they found, they, they found these products uh, uh, online, CBD and hemp products online. So it could be anywhere from a tincture, an oil gummy, edible, et cetera. <clears throat> they started with 200, like I said, they got to 147 tested before they had to shut down for COVID. Um, so you can see that there's 147 products tested. 102 of those had CBD, the amount of CBD indicated on the label. The 48%, please ignore that. I don't know where that came from. Um, and if you go further, uh, of these 102 products that were uh, had the CBD amount labeled, they, there was a, less than half were within 20% of what was labeled when tested. And that's a pretty, um, that's a pretty big inconsistency. And you can see that 17% had less than 80%. Uh, 120% had, um, uh, sorry, 30%, 37% had over 120% of CBD as labeled. But uh, the most interesting thing to me is the THC here. And half of these products of the 147 tested had THC in them, not labeled on the label. And in fact, you can't sell THC uh, through interstate commerce so that they can't even be sold online. So I'm just going to show you a couple of these products just to show you what I'm looking at and, and what I'm telling you uh, about the lack of standardization. So this is one, and you could pull up, I just pulled up the first three that I saw. It could be any of them almost. Um, and you can see here that <clears throat> this one has uh, eight milligrams CBD on it. And that that's really meaningless to me. And you can see in tiny, tiny print, uh, even with my glasses on, I can barely see it per serving. 
but that's still meaningless. Uh, it does say there's 500 milligrams of CBD in the bottle in the red circled line there. They call it on the bottom there, they call it a dietary supplement, which uh, the FDA explicitly says you can't do. Um, the only indication that there might be THC in it is at the very top of that box, you can see it says full spectrum hemp extract, but there is nothing on the label that says uh, THC. And, and also over on the right, you can't really see it very well, but uh, it's, the serving size is one drop or full. So um, I'm not that crazy about how this is labeled. This product online does provide a certificate of analysis, which is a lab test of what actually is in there. Uh, whether or not these are legitimate lab tests, COAs, I don't know. But um, in the red square there that I've, that I've highlighted, uh, uh, you can see that there's, I'll do the math for you, uh, the total potential CBD uh, ends up to be 537 milligrams in the bottle, which is consistent, fairly consistent with what they labeled as 500. But there's 0.7 milligrams of THC per serving. So that turns out to be 21 milligrams of THC in, <clears throat> in this bottle that is unlabeled as such. And that's, that is a lot. So going to the second one that I pulled up, this is called Just CBD, and you can see they have two different products. Uh, this is all that they advertise online. There is no additional information except for these pictures. And this one on the left says this is a hemp seed. Um, the one on the right says full spectrum. So you can presume that full spectrum, like I showed you, has THC in it. Um, all it says is 1,000 milligrams of CBD per bottle, and there is no certificate of analysis available here. You need to get the batch number and find the certificate. So you really have no idea what's in here. This is a, a popular brand uh, that you see, and again, labeling, just, just to show you how inconsistent everything is, uh, you can see the left-hand circle there's, it says 30 milligrams. That's meaningless to me too. In the little um, teardrop there, it has 450 milligrams per bottle. Um, and over on the right-hand side in that circle, uh, it says, uh, sorry, I can't really see it that well, but it's um, full spectrum hemp, 930 milligrams. That, I, that means nothing to me. Um, and nowhere again does it say THC in here, um, and directions again are take a dropper full throughout the day as needed, and that really um, doesn't sit well. So here's, they do offer a COA certificate of analysis, which um, looks a little too clean to me to come from a lab, but they probably fixed it up a little bit. So the total CBD, I'll do the math for you again, uh, ends up to be 450 milligrams in the bottle, which is what they state, so that's good. Uh, but there's also a milligram of THC per serving. So that's a lot, and that's 15 milligrams in this bottle that is 15 milliliters um, that is unlabeled in here. Um, now, this is online, the one on the left. On the right, curiously, um, this is found in a dispensary. So this is a 30 milliliter bottle, so twice the size as the one on the left. Uh, has 900 milligrams of CBD, 30 milligrams of THC uh, labeled on the bottle, um, which is the same exact ratio as this. This is a 30 to one, this is a 30 to one. This you can buy in line, this you can buy in a dispensary, and it is quite a bit more. So this is 10 cents per milligram in the dispensary, whereas the online is three cents per milligram, and I can only assume that that's because of the taxes. So I just want to show you a little bit about <clears throat> what the Farm Bill is. The Farm Bill is the Agricultural Improvement Act of 2018. And this has been talked about a lot because this was a significant move from the um, from Congress to, um, to enact this and update the 2014 Farm Bill. And this essentially removed hemp from the Schedule One status of the Federal Controlled Substance Act. Therefore, hemp is no longer federally regulated as a controlled substance. This was very exciting for a lot of people because um, <clears throat> they figured this is a free-for-all for growing hemp. 
So what is hemp, the definition of hemp? Uh, as, as they state it, it means the, can, the plant, cannabis sativa L, and any part of that plant, including the seeds, derivatives, extracts, and cannabinoids, which is interesting, isomers. So anything in that plant, as long as the plant doesn't have more than 0.3% THC. That's how they define hemp. What the law didn't change, uh, Congress gave, preserved the FDA's uh, authority to regulate any product containing cannabis or cannabis-derived compounds under the FD&C Act. So FDA, you can grow hemp all you want, but the FDA uh, still regulates any product that contains cannabis or cannabis-derived compounds. And they say specifically, it is unlawful to introduce food containing added CBD or THC into interstate commerce or to market these products as dietary supplements. So that's, that's the clearest thing they've ever said, I think. You cannot market CBD and THC as a dietary supplement. This part about food is always confusing because I don't know what the definition of food is. Is a capsule of food? Is a tincture of food? Definitely a beverage or a brownie, I suppose. And that's just a review, same thing, hemp versus drug. Hemp has to be 0.3, less than 0.3 THC. Uh, cannabis bred for drug uh, is, is much higher. They, they shoot for the highest um, percentages. It's still the same plant though, cannabis sativa. So let's get to the education, which is pretty much why I'm here. This is the latest map um, for cannabis legalization, uh, the status in our United States. And this came after the uh, election in November where we added three more legal recreational states, Arizona, South Dakota, and New Jersey. Uh, South Dakota was the most surprising of all, but we have now five, 15 states that uh, have legal medical and recreational cannabis laws. Uh, we have another 20 that have legal medical laws with certain restrictions. Each state um, prescribes its own laws for that. The turquoise states have, uh, you can see I put limited medical laws, but it's really limited because it's CBD only. And some of them don't even allow CBD, uh, like Epidiolex was not even allowed to be sold as a prescription in one of those states up until the last election. It's only two states, Idaho and Nebraska right now, that have uh, no laws at all. Uh, any, any part of that is considered illegal. The most interesting part to me in this map are the ones with the red squares. These are all medical states and they implemented laws that mandate a pharmacist to be in the pharmacy, either as the pharmacist in charge or the owner, or at least on site, uh, uh, during during opening hours uh, to counsel patients, to dispense, uh, you name it. There's all kinds of laws and the pharmacists uh, are mandated to be in those dispensaries. So I think that's fascinating and um, it'd be great if we could do that in California, but the cat's out of the bag and uh, that's not gonna change. So just going over uh, there's, there's several surveys um, of pharmacists uh, and pharmacy students who, uh, regarding their knowledge of cannabis. And this one was done out of Colorado in 2018, published in 2020. Uh, and the, they queried uh, uh, community pharmacists, mostly national chains. Uh, they were mostly working in national chains. They got 51 responses. And you could see that they are, the question was, how often do you receive questions about medical or recreational marijuana? And there's a, a, a great deal of questions that are being asked by the pharmacists. And yet uh, of these 53%, so half of these, even though they're getting questions, were not comfortable at answering the questions that were asked, such as what the indications are, the efficacy, drug interactions, side effects, where to buy it, and if it's if and when it's detected in the body. And here's just one more. This was uh, done by CPHA, 
there were 474 surveys completed. And the, uh, the, when asked about the knowledge, uh, most answers were that these pharmacists had no knowledge, very little, or some knowledge about cannabis, risk, side effects, dosing, et cetera. Uh, but the lower half of the screen is their attitudes, whether medical marijuana has um, efficacy, if there needs to be education, if there needs to be CE available, and that bottom right-hand square uh, shows that they strongly agree with that and they, are, they want education. So these are, I reached out to as many people as I could, colleagues and, and um, you know, just throwing out comments uh, to ask people if they had any kind of program in their pharmacy schools across the nation. And, and this is what I found. Uh, so up, up at the top there, there's UCSD. That's the class that I took, I taught last spring and I'll be teaching it again this spring. Uh, USC just implemented a class uh, taught by Carrie Franson, who brought that from Colorado. Uh, and there's just a handful of others, Ann Arbor's, uh, Gus Rosania, and, and that's it. And these are just electives or potential classes, maybe one class taught within the um, curriculum. University of Maryland has two electives, and they implemented a master's program in medical cannabis science and therapeutics. This does not require any type of degree. This is not a medical, uh, uh, there's no medical requirement. This could be anywhere from somebody who wants to own a dispensary to grow or um, pharmacists as well. And that's uh, upwards of $25,000 for that program. University of Colorado also did the same thing, opened up their master's program, just started in August. To your track, you do have to have a degree, a bachelor's, uh, in order to participate in this. Uh, but this one's $37,000 for out-of-staters. So I think that's a lot to ask to educate our pharmacists. This is just one last slide on um, other colleges around the United States that offer some sort of classes. These are not, as you can see, the type of institution, that four, fourth column there. They're just four-year colleges or law schools. And, and most of them, they could be um, anywhere from uh, plant chemistry, um, agriculture classes at UC Davis, uh, some pharmacology, lots of law classes in these law schools. Um, but there's very little in our pharmacy schools. So in conclusion, I, uh, my recommendations, my, you know, my, I kind of threw a lot of stuff out here, but my main mission really is to advocate for endocannabinoid science and cannabis uh, science in our curriculum in our pharmacy schools. Um, we already have one FDA approved drug, Epidiolex that I mentioned, that can be dispensed by pharmacists and yet there is no training for our pharmacists on this endocannabinoid system. And I think they're in the dark. Uh, their pharmacists, of course, are always tasked with staying up to date with new therapies, new drug therapies, new medications. And this is really no different. This is a drug that is universally used, probably the most used of any drug. Um, and we need to know about that. And of course, there's increased legislation and, and legalization of these products and increase consumer use, and it's only gonna increase uh, further. So as pharmacists are best positioned to counsel patients on potential benefits, risks, side effects, drug interactions, you know, all of that, um, and also help patients navigate the confusing labeling standards, um, I, I think that we need to be educated in order to promote public safety. So I threw a bunch of other things out there and we can talk about those later. I think protection from liability for pharmacists who uh, need to feel free to be able to talk to their patients about cannabis. Um, uh, one of the, I didn't mention, but um, one issue that the community pharmacists complained about is they didn't have access to primary literature in their pharmacies, so they couldn't look anything up. They had to rely on tertiary information. Cannabis is not in those textbooks. Um, and, you know, I think it would be prudent to 
create a, a committee in order to, uh, this is a big topic and there's a lot to do. So perhaps creating a task force that you could collaborate with um, CPHA and CSHP in order to uh, maybe make some of these changes. So I know that was a lot, but um, I'd be happy to answer any questions and you can certainly email me. My email was on that first slide. Uh, so if you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you, Dr. Simonian, for sharing your knowledge with us. I'm, I'm going to take a roll call of members to see if they have questions for you. And then I'm going to open it up to the public. Um, Ryan Brooks, do you have questions for Dr. Simonian? I do. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Simonian, thank you for your incredible presentation. I can say that I did learn a lot today, and I appreciate your time and effort in uh, putting this together. Thank you. Uh, you know, my question is uh, is around dosing. You know, in one of your slides, you had mentioned this is good for people who have MS to reduce spasms. Mm -hmm. You know, if they were to walk into a pharmacy or to a dispensary, and the question is, you know, what's the dosage? What's the level of THC that works for me? How many times a day should I do it? You know, I also have MS and a different pre-existing conditions like a heart condition. Is this going to be okay? How would the pharmacists respond to that question? Uh, that's a really good question, and there's not an easy answer. Uh, the dosing, I didn't really get into it too much because it is very complicated, and, uh, and everybody's different based on their prior use of cannabis um, and, and other issues, what they're using it for. Um, most, so just, just as a broad overview, most most patients who come in who are cannabis naive, uh, older patients usually, uh, most most clinicians, and I'm not a clinician, I don't take care of patients, but uh, I have spoken with a lot of clinicians and learned about it. They'll start with one milligram or a half a milligram of THC uh, in combination with CBD and, and move up carefully from there. And again, it depends on the situation, uh, whether you're using it for MS or sleep or pain. Uh, some people will put a combination of CBD, uh, like a low THC, high CBD during the day, and then increase the THC at night for sleep purposes. So, you know, anywhere between a, a THC dose below five is, uh, pretty universal and can go up to 10. Um, CBD is less well known and it's difficult, more difficult to titrate because THC, you can feel the high CBD. You can't feel it. So it's a, it's a real balancing act and it is definitely individualized. And then is that the same protocol you would use for someone who is five years old versus someone who's 25 years old? Well, uh, again, it depends on the situation. So if, if a five-year-old, I, I probably would not start in a five-year-old unless the five-year-old had, I, I mean, certainly not for, um, for no, you know, uh, chronic pain, patients, uh, five-year-olds not gonna have chronic pain, um, but- say, say seizures. So, so seizures is a different story because uh, what we know from the Epidiolex trials, and I didn't get into them too much, but uh, Epidiolex, the, the trials are all on uh, youth with rare forms of seizures who are already on upwards of four uh, anticonvulsants. And CBD was added to those anticonvulsants, and it showed a significant decline in their seizures. And they were very high doses. There was no THC, it's just CBD at very high doses of um, anywhere between 10 to 20 milligrams per kilogram per day. And then my last you know, question is, you know, given what we know today, and I think the science has come you know, a long way, but I don't, haven't seen any long-term longitudinal studies on the use for specific you know, ailments. Yes, yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. And uh, I, I can tell you every article that I read, every webinar I go to, every person I talk to says that at the very end, 
more research. We need more research. We need more education. We need more research. And and a, a part of that, well, a, a, a huge part of the reason is because it's been stuck in Schedule 1 for a long time. And it's very difficult for universities to get grants for a Schedule 1 substance, and the restrictions are ridiculous. And so we just don't have enough stud studies, certainly longitudinal. But I foresee that changing. Um, it's changing now, you know, I mean, just since 20 years ago, there's been a lot of publications and, uh, you know, if you, if you search PubMed with the right mesh terms, you can pull up 25,000 articles on cannabis right now. Uh, a lot of them are animal studies, of course, but I, I see, I, I can see that growing uh, quickly starting now. Uh, thank you very much. I'll yield my time. Thank you, Ryan. Um, Cheryl Butler, do you have questions? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I just want to say uh, thank you for this presentation. Um, it's just a long time coming. Uh, I can remember in 2016, at least four years ago, um, um, myself being involved with trying to help uh, get uh, legal marijuana uh, available for patients that was in need of it. And um, I do understand, and I've taken um, some CEs, and everything revolves around the fact that uh, due to it uh, being Schedule One, the, the lack of studies have had a lot to do with us not being able to move uh, and, and, and have pharmacists uh, involved in this, who I think should be involved in this. And I certainly would, would appreciate being part of any task force that would be involved with whatever is necessary to, to get this where, for, for example, as far as just hearing what you, you have to say about the, the dosage 30 to one and CBD um, not knowing if, uh, you know, that they're actually getting away with saying it's just CBD and it's THC. Um, like, I'd like to know when you were describing uh, the, the one that was 30 to 1 CBD rich, um, the, my question is, is the THC, is there too much THC? I, 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 I tend to sing to have an issue with, if it says it's only CBD, how are they able to just put, uh, have the THC there? Yeah, well, that's a great question. Um, and, and you know, I'm not against THC. I think, I, I, I believe that the combination of THC and CBD probably has more benefit. THC has more benefit in the use of chronic pain more so than uh, CBD alone. So uh, I do believe in the combination of that uh, and, and how much is too much, it just depends. Uh, but the, the critical part, like you said, is how it's labeled. So if, it's, if it has 12 milligrams or whatever I said in that bottle, that's fine, it, it could work. It's probably good for you know a good combination, but if it's, labeled inappropriately, I think consumers need to know. They need to know that there either is or there isn't THC in that bottle and how much is there so that they can make a decision on how they're going to use it. Yes, that's, that's my concern about, you know, people hallucinating because they're having too much THC. How, right. how, how, would, they, how would they know? Right, absolutely. So... Anyway, but thank you so much. Uh, like I say, this is a long time coming, and I applaud the work that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. Sung Oh, do you have questions? Hi, um, I do. Dr. Simonia, thank you so much for a great presentation. Um, I have a couple questions first about the states that are mandating pharmacists in the dispensaries. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any knowledge on how they're doing and um, how the setups are and if that's feasible for states like us that actually have legal medical and recreational marijuana, if, if it is somewhat something that we can copy into 
Um, I noticed that all the states that have that mandate are the ones that only allow legal medical marijuana. So I'm curious if that's possible for our state to do. Uh, and secondly, if um, if any, is there any um, working relationship with ACPE in adding this kind of information into the curriculum, or is that possible even? Um, those are two questions I have. I, th those are two really great questions. Uh, first, as far as the states with medical and pharmacists mandated, <clears throat> it, uh, you're right, they are only legal medical. And um, I'm so envious of those states because uh, they went from not legal to medical and in the setup, uh, there's every state does it differently. So I I have talked to some people in some of the states and how they set it up. It's very restricted. Uh, uh, for instance, Utah is the latest one to to start this program, and uh, I know the pharmacist who was involved in that, and, and they collaborate with the board of pharmacy and and the state legislature legislators to. Um, to start the program and and mandate the pharmacists, they don't even call them dispensaries. They have to call them pharmacies. And the patient uh, first use has to be counseled by a patient, by a pharmacist, and they monitor them. Uh, every state does it different, like I said. But um, I I I would love for that to happen here. And I've thought you know, I've discussed it with colleagues over and over and over again. How do we do that? How can we get that done? And I, I just don't see it happening because it's already legally wreck and and they don't need pharmacists anymore. They they it, you know, if you're setting up a brand new medical program and you're going in like that, that's one thing. But in a recreational state, there that that train has has um has left and and everybody can just do whatever they want to do. They don't need to have pharmacists. They would have to pay them and who they don't want to do that. So if if someone else can come up with a, a way to do that, I'm all I'm all for it. And I would be a huge advocate of getting pharmacists in those dispensaries. <clears throat> and uh, the second question was about ACPE. I, I have not. Um, uh, I, I'm not sure how, how to do that exactly, but I don't think there's been any collaboration yet. I, I wanted to uh, seek your opinion uh, as the Board of Pharmacy here in California first, and I would love to collaborate and figure out how um, ACPE can get involved so that we implement this across the country. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Uh, Jake Patel, do you have any questions? Yeah, um, Dr. Simonian, thank you for the presentation. It was very educating. Um, um, you know, uh, Cheryl asked those questions that I had um, uh, around dosing. So that is also concerning to me. And um, as a registered pharmacist myself, I, I learned a lot today. Um, and I can only imagine um, at our pharmacy counters today, uh, how many consumers are coming and asking some questions and whether our pharmacists are able to answer these questions um, and guide them in the right direction. So uh, a task force involving um, subject matter experts and, and creating uh, some guideline for already licensed pharmacists, a webinar or something to give them information to educate our consumers so they don't harm themselves is definitely very important. Um, Thank you for the presentation. Really appreciate that your time today. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jig. Um, Ricardo Sanchez, do you have uh, a question or two? Um, just wanted to say to Dr. Simonian that uh, thank you for the education. Uh, you know, she brought a lot of information regarding THC and CBD. Um, I actually did have a question. Uh, do you see any uh, problems with the uh, regulation and enforcement as far as personnel here in California? Uh, regarding, can you be more specific? I'm right for the for. I mean, this is a whole uh, market that's coming up here in California. Yeah. And um, I know we have agents who uh, investigators who go out and enforce uh, the cultivation, the regulation, regulation, uh, and you know enforcement of it. Right. Do you see? Do you see that having a big impact on um, on the industry? 
by having uh, less ages, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I mean, I guess, uh, you know, speaking for, from the cannabis aspect of it, well, how, how that is regulated in dispensaries is actually regulated quite well. It's very restrictive. There's a whole track and trace system in the dispensaries, so it's fairly reliable. They have third-party testing. So cannabis products that are in a dispensary are um, very tightly regulated. Uh, CBD, not so, because it's not really, is it legal? Is it not legal? You know, um, so that's not controlled at all. I think it would be great to have some sort of at least standard labeling on those products um, and, and a track and trace system where they get their product and third party testing, sort of like the dispensaries, although I don't know if I want it regulated quite as strictly as that. Um, as far as regulations in pharmacies, I don't, I don't know how to answer that. Um, I, I think that pharmacists should be, uh, should know that they can talk to their patients about cannabis. Um, after, of course, they should be trained, but they shouldn't be afraid to talk. And I, I have discussed this with other people and pharmacists, and they're not sure. Can we talk about it? It's Schedule 1. I probably shouldn't talk about it with my patients. I don't want to get my license revoked. So... I can see that as being an issue as well. So I'm not sure if I answered your question correctly. Yeah, well, you gave me a lot of information. Thank you. I actually, I represent the uh, the investigators who enforce oh, uh, the okay. marijuana industry. So uh, thank you. Sure. Thank you, Ricardo. Uh, Maria Serpa, do you have questions? Yes, thank you. Um, I was hoping that Dr. Simone could speak more to the um, issues that have been discussed in many pharmacy circles over the years regarding the precarious situation of pharmacists and pharmacies because of the DEA limitations. Um, you know, I can speak what we do in acute care, but, uh, you know, out in the community, I know there are pharmacists that are, uh, as she referred to, uh, concerned about even speaking about this without um, having uh, this be an FDA or legal um a legally authorized discussion. And then the pharmacies themselves uh, are having challenges with, um, you know, are, is this over the counter versus a, a schedule one versus a, you know, unregulated area um, and whether they could stock it or whether they can supply it. Um, and in fact, um, you know, just to speak about, uh, you know, this is kind of a long question, sorry, um, Jill, <laughs> but, um, but in acute care, you know, this has been a long discussion over many years. And just so everyone knows, in acute care facilities, we're not even allowed to have it in the building. We can't even allow a patient to bring in their own products. Um, and that's because it puts our DEA license in jeopardy. Um, and so in acute care, there's a very strict accountability as to what's here uh, and what to do with if the patient brings it in. In the uh, ambulatory area, I'm not quite sure what how that's regulated as well. But um, the other one is uh, the terminology is because this is not an FDA approved product. There's no prescribing. There's no prescription. Um, the words are always recommendation. And um, there's another term that they use. But the word prescribe and prescription makes it sound like a legally accountable drug. And that's why we're not even allowed to use those terms. So long story about um, the DEA and limitations to the practice, Dr. Simonia. Yeah, that I, you're you're absolutely right, and and it's a very muddled situation because uh, so cannabis with high THC. Let's just start with that. Um, obviously, we're not going to have that in the pharmacy. It's a Schedule One, so there's no way we're getting that. We're, and however, the um, the AMA does have language in their um, in the regulations that, uh, that allow physicians to talk about it and, like you said, recommend, not prescribe. They can't write a prescription. They can't dispense it. But they can talk about the use, dosing, um, and the other side effects that, of cannabis, and they will not have their licenses revoked. And that's, the language is very explicit. So I'm not sure what um, the Board of Pharmacy, you know, what the jurisdiction is, but I think it would be um, wise to have something in our regulations that the pharmacists feel protected from at least discussing it with their patients. 
um, and cannabis and or CBD. Now, you know, CBD is different if it's just CBD. The the legal issue there is just insane because um, it is not DEA controlled anymore because anything that has less than 0.3 THC is considered hemp and that's not under DEA regulations anymore. But then the FDA says that you can't sell anything with cannabinoids in it unless it's a um, it has an IND. So it's it's really tricky to know how to navigate that. Um, but people want patients want it. Pa- patients are asking for it and they're buying it. And so whether or not to stock it. Um, I think it's smart to stock it in pharmacies and train our pharmacists so that we can help patients choose the right product and, and use it appropriately. And, you know, as far as, um, let's see, what was the other question? (laughs) Um, that it's a, it's a long, long conversation that I don't really have all the answers to, but, um, as far as bringing it into the hospitals as well, I had that on my last slide, but I, I kind of ran over that one. Uh, that's another uh, really important issue. And there are some states, and I'm sorry, I don't know what they are right now, but some states do have programs where they work with the boards. Um, and I'm, I don't know about the DEA, but I don't know how that works, but they do allow... There's some um, programs that allow patients to bring in their own medical marijuana and use it, and the pharmacy stores it. Uh, I can tell you more about that if I look into that, but obviously we don't do that here, but it sure would be helpful to have some sort of program in place for that. Thank you, Maria. Um, Debbie Veal, do you have questions? Uh, yeah, um, the first thing is, like everybody else said, I uh, really appreciate the presentation. Uh, licensed me myself, and I learned a ton. Um, so I think I was saying that in California, all that's allowed right now is topical CBD and not oral drops. Is that why when you're looking at it, there's so much on the Internet? So I guess that's question number one. And in these states, if you know this answer, where... The pharmacist has to be involved in, uh, in in dispensing. Do they actually allow it in the pharmacy, or I mean, isn't that the, the issue that the that the since it's a um, schedule one, you can't actually have it in the pharmacy? Um, I think that's it. Okay, so let me start with that one. Um, in, in these states, they're not in pharmacies per se. They are separate. They're in uh, they're in dispensaries, but they are called pharmacies, and it's like a quote unquote pharmacy. So there is no pharmacy license in the dispensaries. They are licensed as dispensaries, <clears throat> but pharmacists who are working outside of um, being a pharmacist not paid as much either um, working in those dispensaries. But they are counseling patients. They're just not operating as pharmacies. And then, um, <clears throat> what was the first question? Sorry. <laughs> um, sorry. Um, I was thinking in California, you can only have CBD for um, the, oh, oh, the top place. Place. Right, sure. Yeah, so um, because the FDA says that any food containing CBD <clears throat> um, is has to be regulated under the FDNC Act. Technically, no CBD is legal under the FDA's eyes. Um, but topical may not be considered food. So it's that it's that word food that is um, kind of interesting. And so the big chains got so they they were they were calling they were carrying some of these products that were either the sublingual oils or capsules or whatever. And uh, the FDA did send some warning labels out to them, and they and they switched to just using the topicals. Uh, you know, everybody, every one of these companies just tries to find a way to fly under the radar. And one of the ways is uh, by not making any health claims. So if you don't say anything on your label or website uh, that says this is going to treat, uh, diagnose, cure, mitigate, whatever, a disease uh, like a drug says, 
uh, you'll get a letter from the FDA. Uh, so everybody tries to use something else like um, uh, soothe your muscles or, you know, any other kind of language to not make any claims. And, you know, the FDA just can't chase down all these thousands of companies that are online and selling it, you know, in, in all kinds of different areas. It's, it, it, if they could, they probably would, but um, they just don't have the, um, you know, the capacity to do that right now. Thank you. So, hey, Greg, Greg is yeah. happy. I, I just want to let you know I am, I have to drop for a little while. Okay, thank you. All right. Okay, Albert Wong, do you have a question? Yes, I do. Um, uh, first of all, uh, Dr. Simonian, uh, thank you for the presentation. I wish I had this a little earlier, then I would know how to invest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I already did that, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> okay, um, I, I got a couple questions. Um, uh, the our Asian community, our Chinese, I work in the Chinese community, and as a whole, and even myself, we are pretty ignorant about the CBD. I I've been working here all those years. I I I don't have a single question about the CBD uh, that uh, comes to me. So I know that um, it's a taboo subject in our, in our, in our culture. So um, do you have any? Uh, do you know there's any literature or any uh, pamphlet or any information that other language, like Chinese language, so we could uh, educate them uh, to put on the counter so they will know about this subject? Well, that's, that's a great question. I, I, you know, I really hadn't thought about that before. I, I think it's a fantastic idea. And, and, you know, overall, there has to be just a, a broad, um, uh, educating um, uh, push for all communities, and um, I mean it's it, it, it's going to take a lot of work, but that's that's certainly something that we should include in in this um, endeavor. Well, well, I think I think they know I know the, the they know about the THC, but they don't know anything about the CBD. You know, right, right, the, the, the difference. So. Yeah. Uh, my second question is that uh, I know they, uh, those company uh, uh, would like to put that in the beverage, uh, the CBD in beverage. Did uh, okay. those companies succeed doing so? Yeah, well, the, um, they, I, I, I haven't followed all of them, of course. Um, they, people are putting it in everything. You know, you, you can go to the, coffee shop in LA and there's CBD in your latte and um, where do they get it? How much are they using? There's absolutely zero regulation on that. And the FDA, it, for whatever else it does it, with the language that is very difficult to understand, um, they're very explicit like that says you cannot put CBD in food or beverage. So the people are doing it, um, but they really, are, it's, that's considered illegal. Okay, so so it's illegal to do so, but they are doing so, right? Yep. Okay, okay. Thank you for the presentation. I, really, I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you, Albert. Uh, Jason Weiss, do you have questions? Yes, uh, I reiterate the comments from my fellow board members, Dr. Simone, and thank you for the very thorough presentation. Um, my question is regarding the incoming uh, Biden administration. I'm going to ask you to read some tea leaves here. Is there any hope that uh, they will loosen regulations allowing for more flexibility of uh, pharmacists uh, to advise uh, patients uh, on these issues? Yeah, there's there's a lot of hope <laughs> in the industry. I, the, the, the industry is uh, very hopeful that this administration will change things. Although it's Mitch McConnell who actually put that farm bill through to remove hemp from the DEA restrictions. So that was curious. Obviously, that was a much broader bill than just hemp. Um, but but yesterday, um, you know, to add to that, yesterday the UN voted to remove cannabis from their category of most dangerous drugs, which includes heroin and clearly marijuana 
cannabis is not as dangerous as heroin. And, you know, in the, it, my little history section that I, uh, that I went through earlier, uh, that, that's part of the reason why it became uh, a Schedule One is there was a whole movement of all kinds of things. But the UN at that time had put um, cannabis in its da most dangerous category. And yesterday they voted to remove it. So I think it's going to keep coming and there's going to be more and more research and more users. And that's why I feel um, uh, that we really need to get out in front of this. Very good, thank you very much. Right. Thank you, Jason. And thank you, Dr. Simonian, for answering our board questions. Now it's time for public um, comment or questions. So moderator, could you please open the lines for the public? All right, this is the moderator and at the direction of the board, I have opened up the Q&A panel for public comment. Uh, members of the public, if you would like to make a public comment on this agenda item, please click on that icon of a question mark within a square, located at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen. All right, and it looks like we do have one individual who has requested public comment. Give me one second while I get my timer up and running. All right, individual identified as Robert Stein. Robert, you will be given two minutes to speak in a 10 second warning. I am unmuting your microphone now. Thank you. I, I'd like to echo the board members um, accommodation of Dr. Simonian's presentation. It was outstanding. Um, I just have a few um, comments in terms of where we go from here. One of the questions that came up from the board members were, are pharmacists afraid to talk about um, you know, medical cannabis uh, or recreational cannabis for that matter? Um, and I think the answer to that is uh, the First Amendment protects uh, pharmacists from uh, talking about this. Um, there was a case related to physicians um, about 10 or 15 years ago um, that talked about this exact same issue because DEA was threatening uh, to take away licenses from physicians that recommended cannabis. Um, my second point, and I think this is really the most important one, I, I believe the Board of Pharmacy needs to have some kind of a task force that is cross um, cross filled with members of the Bureau of Cannabis Control. Um, we have two widely different ways of, of regulating uh, products that have uh, pharmacologic action. And it seems to me that, especially with medical cannabis, um, the expertise of the pharmacists on the Board of Pharmacy um, would also help in terms of ensuring that medical cannabis is safe uh, for Californians. Thanks. Thank you, Robert. Okay. All right, um, this is the moderator. It looks, looks like that was ahead. our only individual who has requested public comment. Okay, uh, let's close it up. And uh, would you like me to close the Q&A panel at this point? Uh, yes, please. Oh, I apologize. Um, my co-moderator stated that oh. there's another individual, but unfortunately I'm not seeing it. Okay, it says the question has been answered. Okay, um, if there isn't, there isn't. It uh, looks like Sonia Wells has requested public comment. Uh, okay, go ahead. Give me one moment. All right, um, Sonia, you'll be given two minutes to speak in a 10 second warning. I am unmuting your microphone now. Okay, hi, um, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I actually, I am on probation and uh, buying for early termination today, but um, my community service as a, as a pharmacist was to work with the Western Neuropathy Association. And um, what the other board members have expressed about pharmacists being uh, a little leery to talk about it is, is, has been very true in my situation. But um, there are so many people with neuropathy who have so many questions about THC and CBD, and I've been leery to talk about it, you know, especially since I've been, I'm on probation. But they have, they have so many questions. So my first question is, um, is there a certain place or that I can refer them to if they have questions that is that is extremely valuable information for them if they are seeking out information about THC or CBD. 
And the other question that I had is, um, I when I talk to people about their use of CBD and THC, it seems like what I get from people is that it's much more effective with the THC in it. Um, is Are there any studies that have compared THC containing products to CBD only products as far as the efficacy for things like neuro neuropathic pain? Okay, Bo both great questions. Um, I, I'm gonna start with that last one. And uh, I, I believe you're right that THC t seems to work better in combination with CBD than CBD alone uh, for neuropathic pain in very low doses as tolerated. Uh, THC can be very well tolerated uh, without any, um, any real cognitive impairment if given in the right doses and started slow. It's, you know, the, the term is start low, go slow. So uh, that has been shown. I don't know of any studies that have compared the two, um, THC with CBD and CBD alone. Uh, like I said, the studies are, they're, they're, they're starting to increase now, the research, but it was really limited for a long time. I know there's a study, um, Ziva Cooper at UCLA is conducting a study on CBD in arthritis, uh, just plain CBD, but as far as the comparative studies for neuropathic pain, I, uh, I, to my knowledge, there isn't any, but of course, like I said, you could pull up 25,000 articles on PubMed, so I probably don't know all of those. Um, okay. <laughs> as far as the, um, sorry, what was, your, what was the first question? Uh, uh, the first question was, um, can you give me some sort of resource? Oh, yeah. Uh, okay. Now, that, that's a really good question, too, because we don't have anything. And, and you know, what you want to do is you want to be able to write on a label, uh, talk to your doctor or pharmacist. And <laughs> you, why would you? Because they don't know how to answer the questions. So we need to put together, I, I personally know some people who are uh, cannabis clinicians, but um, there's not, there's not a site in particular, a website or a group um, that I would people can access to say, go here, go there. There are some pain management specialists who are uh, very knowledgeable, but um, nothing, you know, um, nothing really solid to send people to. And uh, that's why I think it's really important that um, all pharmacists know so that you can send them to the pharmacy to ask a pharmacist about um, these questions. Okay, thank you <laughs> so much. Okay, thank you. Um, moderator, it doesn't look like there's any more. Um, so we can close it. Thank you. It looks like there's no further request for public comment. I will go ahead and close the public comment feature. Thank you. Okay, uh, we will now be taking a 10 minute break. Uh, so please uh, indicate that. Uh, Co-moderator. At what time would we like to resume? Uh, we will resume at, well, let's make it 10.55. Uh, 10.55 it is. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you again for your very thorough presentation. Okay. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and close off, and then you're going to take over the meeting, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. We're All going right. on to the uh, uh, petition hearings. Thank you. Okay. Thanks so much.
I'm going to take a roll call, make sure everybody's back before we go on to the petition hearings. Ryan Brooks? I'm here. Thank you. Cheryl Butler? Charlie Beck? I'll go on to, uh, is Shirley Kim with us now? Shirley? No. Sung O. I'm here. Thank you. Jake Patel. Jake? Okay. Are you muted? I think I hear you. Okay. Ricardo Sanchez. You hear? Here. You muted? Okay. Maria Serpa. Here. Thank you. Debbie Veal is gone. Uh, Albert Wong. I'm here. I'm here. Thank you. Jason Weiss. Here. Thank you, Jason. Uh, Cheryl Butler, are you back? Okay. Yes. Oh, okay, thank you. Okay, and Shirley Kim has not joined us yet. Okay, uh, let's uh, go ahead. I'm going to uh, turn the meeting over to the Administrative Law Judge, Marcy Larson, who will pre preside over the petition hearing. Uh, All right, good, good morning. Uh, do we have uh, Dr. Lee with us yet this morning? Moderator is Dr. Lee here. I believe so. Are we starting with uh, Dr. Lee? Yes. yes, we are. Yes, we are. Okay. My apologies. Um, let me go ahead and promote to a panelist. And Dr. Lee, you should be able to unmute your microphone and also start your video. Yes. All members, it's time to start video. Um, and this is the moderator, just real quick, um, board member Wong, I noticed you were logged in on your computer as well. Um, are you able to disconnect the uh, audio on that end? Because when you uh, spoke earlier, there was some echoing. Albert, can you mute and answer uh, the moderator? Can you unmute? Uh, I'm here. No, she. Uh, are you also on with the phone? <laughs> Because we're getting feedback. Okay. Moderator. All right. Sounds like we're not getting feedback anymore. From, okay. Um, is my from is my video up? I don't see myself. Yes, your video is working. Okay. And I'll say you let me. Can you guys hear me now? Yes. Okay. Is Thank that you. okay now? It seems to be okay now. Okay. <clears throat> Has Dr. Lee joined the call yet? The moderator looks like we do have Dr. Lee. Um, Dr. Lee, are you able to unmute your microphone to give us a quick mic check? Right now. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we yes, can hear we... you. Thank you. Thank you. Good Thank morning, you, Dr. Everyone. Lee. Good morning. And Christina Jervis, I saw you earlier. Are you still there? 
Uh, yes, good morning, Your Honor. This is uh, Christina Jarvis. Good morning. All right, uh, Dr. Lee, Ms. Jarvis, um, in just a moment here, I'm going to announce your case, Dr. Lee, and uh, I will have Ms. Jarvis and you announce yourselves for the record. For this first hearing, I'm going to have all of our board members announce themselves, uh, and I will establish a quorum, and then I will explain how the hearing is going to proceed this morning, and then if you have any questions, Dr. Lee, you can ask me at that time. All right? Thank you. Yes. All right. All right. Good morning. We are here before the Board of Pharmacy, Department of Consumer Affairs, State of California, in the matter of the petition for early termination of probation of Lone M. Lee. This is pharmacy case number 5610, OAH case number 202-011-0747. My name is Marcy Larson. I'm an administrative law judge with the Office of Administrative Hearings. I'm presiding over the matter this morning. We are here at the uh, date uh, of the notice of hearing. It is December 3rd, 2020. It's approximately 11.01 a.m. This matter is being uh, conducted by video. And for the first hearing this morning, I'm going to ask our board members to please announce themselves for the record, starting with uh, the board president. Yes, Greg Lippi, board president, uh, public member. All right, and Ms. Veal is, uh, Dr. Veal is not with us today, is that correct? Uh, she will be returning, but she's not with us right now. All right, and then Dr. Serpa, are you here this morning? Yes, Maria Serpa, licensee. All right, and Mr. Brooks. I'm here also, thank you, Judge. All right, and Dr. Butler. Yes, I'm here. All right, good morning, and then uh, Ms. Kim is not with us, correct? Correct. She's supposed to be joining at 11. It's 11.02. She's not here yet. All right. And then Dr. O, are you with us? Hi, I'm here. Uh, licensed member. And Dr. Patel? I'm here. Licensed member. And Mr. Sanchez? Ricardo Sanchez, public member. Right. And Mr. Weiss? Jason Weiss, public member. And Dr. Wong? Yeah, Dr. Wong is a professional member. All right. All right, we do have a quorum. Um, and uh, Deputy Attorney General, if you would please state your appearance for the record. Yes, good morning, Your Honor. I'm Deputy Attorney General Christina Jarvis. I am appearing on behalf of the Attorney General for the people of the state of California. And my role here is not adversarial, but is intended to protect the public interest. Thank you. All right. Good morning. And Dr. Lee, you're here this morning representing yourself. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Yes, Hannah. All right. So as I mentioned before, um, I'm going to briefly explain how the hearing is going to proceed this morning. Dr. Lee, uh, this hearing is concerning your petition for early termination of your probation. Uh, yes. So you understand is that the board members have your petition package um, and they have reviewed your petition package. How the hearing will proceed is that the Deputy Attorney General will uh, proceed, proceed first. She will submit uh, and identify for the record the petition package um, and she will provide the board with an orientation of this matter, history of your license and the discipline of your license. After that, I will swear you in and you will have an opportunity to present your case. Um, the board is concerned about uh, the rehabilitation efforts that you've undertaken since your license was placed on probation. Um, um, after you've testified, the board mem members will um, have an opportunity to question you um, after the attorney general questions you. So she will question you first and then the board members will question you as well. Um, then if there is any other additional testimony that you would like to add, you will have an opportunity to do that. Um, after you've presented all of your uh, information and evidence, um, later in the day, the board will go into closed session and deliberate. You will not receive a decision today. You will receive a decision sometime in the future. During the hearing, I cannot provide you any legal advice, but if you have any questions about the procedures, please let me know, and if I can answer the question, I will. Do you understand? 
Yes, thank you. Yes. All right. Do you have any questions? Do you have any questions? No, I don't have any questions so far. Thank you. All right. All right, then with that, Ms. Jarvis, please um, identify the, the documents in the case and provide the board with a brief overview of this matter. Yes, thank you, Your Honor. And the documents were previously uploaded to the OAH Secure File, file Transfer System. Um, and so I can identify them as Exhibit 1, um, which starts with a blank page that unfortunately erroneously reads Exhibit A, um, but it should be Exhibit 1. Uh, and that includes the electronic ref recording consent form, the petition packet, which includes the also the notice of petitioner, notice to petitioner of this petition hearing, um, also the recommendation letters that I will address in a moment, uh, continuing education certificates, and then finally the actual underlying decision and order um, at the end of the packet. And so I will discuss all of those and at the end of uh, my reading of them, I will ask for them to be all be admitted as Exhibit 1. All right, so Ms. Jarvis, what I would like to do is admit, uh, is to mark uh, the notice of hearing before the petition package as Exhibit 1 and then the petition package as Exhibit 2. That's because the notice of hearing is just a jurisdictional document. Uh, okay. any, objection, any objection to that? No, not a problem. All right, and Dr. Lee, I want to make sure that you have all the documents that Ms. Jarvis is referring to. Do you, in fact, have the notice of hearing and the petition package? Yes, I do have it in front of me. All right, yeah, excellent. All right, Ms. Jarvis, Ms. Jarvis, if you would please continue. Yes, so then the notice of hearing itself is page seven of the PDF that was uploaded, and then everything else after that will just be exhibit two. Correct, thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right, so this matter arose through an accusation that was filed on February 5th, 2016. Petitioner entered into a stipulated settlement, effective January 11th, 2017, by which her license was revoked, the revocation was stayed, and she was placed on probation for five years. There were 13 causes for discipline listed in the accusation, all of which arose out of an inspection of petitioner's pharmacy, West Coast Pharmacy. Now, I do want to note for the record that the petitioner was the owner of West Coast Pharmacy, but was not the PIC and did not work at the pharmacy as a pharmacist. Therefore, when I discuss the actual violations, I will be referring to the respondent uh, to just refer to the pharmacy and then petitioner Lee in her capacity as the owner of that pharmacy. And when I refer to the petitioner, I will be referring to the petitioner Lee specifically. Um, so generally, I only refer to petitioner, but in this case, the pharmacy itself is not a petitioner. So I'm trying to make the record a little bit more clear by making that distinction. Um, so in short, the violations were first failing to properly secure drugs. Uh, the respondent had completed two DEA 106 forms stating that the pharmacy had been broken into and robbed twice. Respondent stored the complete inventory of controlled substances in safes that were kept unlocked and accessible both to pharmacy staff and other individuals, such as delivery drivers, without any supervision by a pharmacist. An inventory also showed that respondent was short approximately 2,680 tablets of alprazolam and oxycodone and 10,381 milliliters of promethazine with codeine. The second cause for discipline was fa failure to report loss of controlled substances in that respondent had failed to report the robberies discussed in the previous cause to the Board of Pharmacy. The third cause is failing to maintain a current inventory. In addition to the losses discussed in the first cause for discipline, respondent also had approximately 1,200 tablets more than she could account for of hydrocodone. Fourth cause for discipline is that respondent failed to provide oral consultation to patients. The board inspector on the day that the pharmacy was inspected observed at least 14 patients who were picking up prescriptions that respondent system had marked as new prescriptions and respondent failed to provide consultation to any of these patients. Additionally, the pharmacy technician or clerk who was providing the prescriptions to the patients simply asked if the patients quote, had any questions rather than whether or not they wanted a consultation from the pharmacist themselves. 
The fifth cause for discipline is failing to have or comply with a quality assurance program, despite admitting to several prescription errors in the year preceding the inspection. The sixth cause for discipline was violation of the pharmacist to technician ratio. In that respondents PIC was the only pharmacist in the pharmacy during the inspection, and there were two technicians that were performing technician duties at the same time. The seventh was failing to exercise corresponding responsibility. In that, the PIC had identified a forged prescription dated May 7, 2015, and had refused to fill that forged prescription. On May 26, just 19 days later, respondent filled a nearly identical prescription to the forgery that was also a forged prescription for 100 tablets of oxycodone that had multiple red flags. Respondent failed to perform any due diligence whatsoever regarding the latter forged prescription. The eighth cause for discipline was dispensing a prescription containing a significant error. In that, respondent filled the forged prescription discussed in the previous cause for discipline. The ninth is failing to complete or have available at the pharmacy any compounding self-assessment. The tenth was compounding prescription drug preparations using expired drugs or drug products. The inspector observed expired drugs and drug products, both above and below the compounding counter. Seven prescriptions for estriol and testosterone were identified that had been compounded using expired drugs and products. There were 13 additional compounded preparations that were apparently stored for future use in essentially mason jars, glass jars, with handwritten dates of expiration on them. Some of those dates went as far back as June 22nd of 2011. Some of those dates were also crossed out and then new dates were handwritten in. And some of those compounded preparations were still expired despite the rewriting of new expiration dates. The 11th cause for discipline was failing to store drugs or components in the manner required, as set forth in the previous cause for discipline, the expired drugs, and in that there was a 30 gram jar used for count compounding that bore only a single word, quote, biased, B-I-E-S-T, without any other necessary information, such as expiration, manufacturer, lot number, or any of the other multitude of requirements. The 12th cause for discipline was incompetence, as discussed in the previous 11 causes for discipline. And the 13th is gross negligence, as discussed in the previous 12 causes for discipline. Now, in support of her petition, petitioner has provided continuing education transcripts showing that she completed 30.25 hours in August and September of 2019. Petitioner submitted five letters of recommendation, all of which were verified. Three of those authors were familiar with this disciplinary action, but two were not. The authors of these letters included a friend, a family member of a patient, petitioner's current supervisor and a pharmacist in charge, and a family member who is also a pharmacist, and then a pharmacist who has worked with the petitioner. Petitioner is in full compliance with her probation terms, including paying the $9,000 cost recovery in full and completing the ethics course and 12 hours of remedial education. Petitioner also provided a four page document outlining her rehabil rehabilitation efforts. Petitioner will address the board in a moment, uh, but one area of concern in reviewing that document is petitioner's description of why she was disciplined. She states, quote, I got the disciplinary action against me for my pharmacist in charge and staffs who did not follow pharmacy policies slash procedures and controlled substances management, close quote. Now, while petitioner was the owner and not the PIC and did not work at the pharmacy, this was still her responsibility. She was the owner of the pharmacy and her statement here appears to be minimizing her role and her control over the pharmacy, which would be inappropriate for somebody who is requesting early termination of probation. Um, so I would ask the petitioner to address that uh, responsibility for the pharmacy during her statement. Um, and your honor, if exhibits one and two are entered, I will turn the floor over to the petitioner at this time. All right, Dr. Lee, with regards to the first exhibit, the notice of hearing, uh, did you in fact receive that notice of hearing? 
I'm sorry, I can't hear you well. Um, Your Honor, can you repeat that? Yes. Did you receive Exhibit 1, the notice of hearing? Yes, I do. I do. I have. All right. Do you have any? Do you have any objection to Exhibit One, the notice of hearing? Um, it's just the first page document that tells you about how uh, about the date and time of the hearing today. Yes, I do. All right. Do you have any objection to it? Is there any anything that you believe is incorrect about the notice of hearing? Um, no, I don't see anything wrong with that. Yeah. All right. Exhibit one is admitted for jurisdictional purposes. And then the remaining documents are all part of the petition package. Do you have any objection to the petition package? Um, I, do, I do not. Your Honor. Right. Exhibit, exhibit two is admitted. All right. Dr. Lee, now's your opportunity to testify on your own behalf. So the first thing I need to do is swear you in. If you would please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you give in this matter will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, nothing Please. but the truth, but the truth. Yes. Please state and spell your name. My name is Loan, L-O-A-N, M, last name is Lee, L-E. All right, Dr. Lee, now is your opportunity to testify on your own behalf. You may provide any information that you want the board to consider for purposes of making a decision on whether or not to grant your petition. As I mentioned before, they have your petition package, so they have read the information you have submitted, so you don't have to repeat uh, information that is in there, but if there are particular things that you want to highlight for the board concerning your rehabilitation, you can certainly do that. And as I explained, after you testify, Ms. Jarvis will have an opportunity to question you. And then the board members will also have an opportunity to question you. Now, you're a bit faint when you, when I, when you speak. I'm ha it's a little difficult to hear you. I'm not sure if you can get closer to your microphone, but that will certainly help to make sure that everybody can hear you. Yes, Your Honor. Can you hear me well? Now? Yes, that is better. Yes, thank you. All right, you may begin. Okay. Um, yes, my name is Lauren um, Lee, and I was the owner at West Coast Pharmacy, which has been closed for five years. And um, I've been put on probation for almost, almost four years. And um, I, I think, I believe I deserve to be released early. Um, I, yes, of course, I would take all the responsibility for my staff and um, my PIC, you know, uh, the pharmacist in charge uh, for all the wrongdoing that they did in the past. Um, but um, truly speaking that I had mentioned that I work at the Kmart pharmacy for almost 10 years at the time. Um, I admit that I didn't have much time to, you know, to um, control and, um, you know, inspect the pharmacy to make it right. Um, I've learned from that and then I need to be, um, you know, because I, I, I took all the responsibility for that. So I've been four years of probation and um, I've been trying the best that I can by uh, successfully uh, fulfill all my probation, all of my probation requirement um, by doing the submitted the hours of work a quarterly report, and I was inspected by the uh, board of pharmacy, um, and as I satisfy all the conditions that the board require, um, and I have my good um, rehabilitation and effort at rehabilitation and other accomplishment at work, um, doing the community event, family responsibility, by taking care of my two kids. Uh, they are teenagers. Um, I have learned in, in, in my practice, and I'm, I'm trying to improve my practice. I've been working for 22 years, and I do, in, you know, by the control substance now, nowadays, um, I'm extra carefully filling the prescription for sure. Um, you know, checking the cure, that is a really good program to help the pharmacist nowadays. Uh, checking the cure report 
and any um, I have to contact doctor to get the medical justification before filling the prescription. Um, especially controlled substance, I try not to fill too much of control, like more than 100 tablets uh, in the prescription. Um, and I'm doing, um, you know, control inventory every uh, quarterly, um, monthly and quarterly to comply with the pharmacy law and uh, regulation. Um, staying on probation will uh, cause me a hardship, uh, really hard for me uh, to find a job that's close to home so that I can take care of my kids. For the past four years, I haven't had a chance to take care of them, taking them to school and, um, you know, joining any other activities with them. So being off probation would help me to achieve my goal in life. Um, I could be able to help my kids uh, to do other things. You know, my two teenagers right now that they needed help. Um, and I wish I could be uh, granted for this so I can do more in the future to help my kid and also taking care of my, my mom who is almost 80, 80 years old. So I wish that um, the board will grant me the early termination on my probation. I really appreciate that. Thank you for your time. All right, thank you, Dr. Lee. Ms. Jarvis, do you have any questions for Dr. Lee? I do, thank you, Your Honor. Um, Dr. Lee, you've talked about you want to get a job closer to home. Is that your primary goal? Yes, um, so that I can have more time taking care of my kid. You know, I can go in and out and, um, you know, be on the schedule that is, they needed me to be. So do you intend to get into the position either by starting or purchasing um, of owning a pharmacy again in the future? No, I won't. Never, <laughs> sorry. And then would you accept a position as a pharmacist in charge at a pharmacy if it was offered to you? No, I would not. Because Why I not? wanna have more time with my kids. And from, from this, I learn a lot. So either I be the BIC or, you know, I won't be, you know, because the BIC, you need a lot of time and work um, to, you know, make the pharmacy is, you know, comply with law and all that stuff. So you just have to spend a lot of time. So I don't intend to be that. No, I'm just regular staff. That's all I need to do. And now could be able to make, um, earn money to support my two kids. You know, eventually they will go to college. Okay, thank you. I have no other questions. I'll turn the floor over to the board. Thank you. All right. All right. Uh, for our board members, starting with the uh, board president, any questions? No questions, Your Honor. All right. Um, and Thank you. Dr. Dr. Serpa, do you have any questions for Dr. Lee? No, sir. No questions. Thank you for your testimony. Mr. Brooks, do you have any questions for Dr. Lee? Mr. Brooks? Brian, are you unmuted? This is the moderator. Let me um, promote Ryan um, back up. It looks like he fell into the attendee list. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, no questions, thank you. All right. Uh, Dr. Butler, any questions for Dr. Lee? Uh, no questions, just a comment that, uh, that well, actually, uh, just double checking, uh, I saw 51 hours of CE in 2017. Did you, in fact, do 51 hours of CE in 2017? I'm sorry, I can't hear you well. Can you speak louder, please? One CE or something? I, that's all I can hear. No, I, I was just looking at the continuing education uh, right after this that where it showed that you had 51 hours of continuing education during the year of 2017. Uh, yes, whatever the continued education, because I have to um, complete the 22 CE pharmacy ethic and professionalism course and also um, complete the 11 unit of uh, remedial uh, education requirement and all with my CE. So 
I believe that's what it, whatever is in the package, that's what the hours that I work, I, I work on the CE. Thank you. All right, Dr. O, any questions for Dr. Lee? I don't have any questions. Thank you. All right, and then uh, Mr. Patel, any questions for Dr. Lee? No questions, thank you. Right, Mr. Sanchez, any questions for Dr. Lee? Uh, yeah, no questions. All right, uh, Mr. Weiss, any questions for Dr. Lee? No questions, Your Honor. Dr. Wong, any questions for Dr. Lee? Yes. Um, Dr. Lee, while you're on probation, when you first on probation, did you lose any contract uh, with any of those the PBM? I'm sorry. Do I lose any contract? Yeah, with the PBM. With the PBM? Yeah, because you're on probation. Uh, did, did you lose yeah, any? Yeah. Um, no, at the time I was still working for Kmart, and then after that, um, in uh, 2016, um, March of 2016, the uh, Kmart pharmacy is closing down. Um, so after that, I was unemployed for a little bit, and then and and then I was got employed back to the independent pharmacy, so I don't have to deal with any uh, PDM. No, what I'm what I'm talking about. Um, you, w while you're on probation at the beginning, you still own the pharmacy, right? No, the pharmacy was closed out at the time. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Uh, no further question. All right, Dr. Lee, is there any additional testimony you would like to add? I think I have everything that I need to address, uh, Your Honor. All right. Uh, Ms. Jarvis, anything further before closing remarks? Uh, yes, Your Honor. Just to go to Dr. Wong's last question, the pharmacy permit, there was a discontinuance of business that became effective on November 16th of 2015. So that was prior to the probation beginning. Um, and then the cancellation of that permit was processed on December 16th of 2015. Um, so just based on the time period there, at the time that the proba that probation would have been affected for the pharmacy, there was no longer a pharmacy in existence. Yeah. All right, then with that, Ms. Jarvis, do you wish to give any closing remarks? Uh, yes, Your Honor. Um, I just would submit to the board that at this time, the petitioner has served nearly four years of her probation. She agreed through the stipulation to serve five. Um, but she has been 100% compliant with her probation to date, and therefore I have no recommendation for the board. Thank you. All right, Dr. Lee, is there any uh, closing remarks you would like to make? No, Your Honor. All right, is the matter submitted for the board's consideration, Dr. Lee? I can't hear you well, I'm sorry, <laughs> Your Honor. I said it are you submitting the the matter now to, for the board's consideration? Um, I can just hear matter of consideration. That's all right. Yeah. So, so all I'm asking is, are you done presenting evidence, and can the board now consider the matter? Yes, I'm done. <laughs> all right. Know. I'm sorry. All right, uh, Ms. Jarvis, is the matter submitted? It is. Thank you, Your Honor. All right, the matter is submitted, and the record is closed. Uh, this has concluded your uh, petition hearing, Dr. Lee, and there is nothing further, so you uh, can hang up if you wish. Thank you, Your Honor, and thank you, everyone, uh, for uh, taking your time with me today. I really appreciate that. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I believe the next petition okay, in order is Ms. Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize, Your Honor. Um, no, that's fine. Uh, I was just going to mention that um, we do now have a uh, board member Kim on um, for our next petition. And I believe our next petition okay, is you. Hannah. Right. So I will go ahead and get Hannah promoted up to a panelist. And um, Hannah, you should be able to unmute your microphone to speak and turn on your camera.
All right, do we have, is it Dr. Mason? You're muted. There we go. Yes. Yes, Dr. Good Mason. Good morning. No. All right, Miss Mason? Yes, I'm Miss Mason. All right. Hello, this is Judge Larson. I'm the judge who's going to be presiding over your hearing this morning. Uh, in just a moment here, I'm going to announce uh, the, the, your case, and I will have you announce yourself for the record, along with Ms. Jarvis, who represents the, uh, the Attorney General in this matter. And then I will briefly go over how the hearing is going to proceed this morning. And then if you have any questions, you can ask me at that time. All right? That's fine. Thank you. All right. All right. We are before the Board of Pharmacy, Department of Consumer Affairs, State of California, in the matter of the petition for reduction of penalty by Hannah Mason. This is board, num uh, board case number 4207. Uh, this is OAH case number uh, 202-012-0020. My name is Marcy Larson. I'm an administrative law judge with the Office of Administrative Hearings. I'm presiding over this matter on December 3rd, 2020. Like 2020 it's approximately 11.31 a.m. We do have a quorum of the board present, uh, present, and it's my understanding that public member Ms. Kim has also joined uh, the, the the hearing as well. Um, and with that, Ms. Jarvis, if you would please state your appearance for the record. Yes, good morning. I am Deputy Attorney General Christina Jarvis, and I am appearing here on behalf of the Attorney General for the people of the state of California. My role here is not adversarial, but it is intended to protect the public interest. Thank you. And Ms. Hannah, if you would just please state your name for the record. My name is Hannah Mason. All right, so Ms. Mason, this hearing today is concerning the petition that you filed with the board for reduction of the penalty of your probation. You have the burden of proving that you should receive the reduction that you're seeking. The board has the petition package that has been submitted. Uh, those documents were, I believe, uh, submitted by you. Do you have a copy of the petition package in this matter? Yes, I do. Okay. So the board has received that package and reviewed that package. Um, how the hearing will proceed this morning is that Ms. Jarvis will go first. She will identify the petition package and documents in this case. Um, and then she will give the board a brief overview of the history of your license and discipline. After that, I will swear you in. You will have an opportunity to testify on your own behalf. You can provide the board with any information that you would like them to consider for purposes of issuing their decision in this matter. Uh, after you are done te testifying, Ms. Jarvis will have an opportunity to question you. And then the board members will also have an opportunity to question you as well. Um, after uh, the board members have questioned you, I will ask you if you have anything else you would like to add. And then you and Ms. Jarvis can both give brief closing remarks. Uh, after the end of the hearing, the matter will be submitted. And then the board later in the day will go into closed session and deliberate and make a decision. You will not receive a decision today. You will receive that decision uh, in the future sometime in the mail. During this proceeding, I cannot give any legal advice, but if you have any questions about the procedures, please let me know, and if I can answer the question, I will. Do you have any questions, Ms. Mason, before we get started? No, Your Honor. All right, Ms. Jarvis, if you would please begin by identifying the exhibits in this matter. Uh, yes, Your Honor. At this time, I will identify the um, exhibit one. Uh, which can be just the first page of the petition packet, which is the uh, notice of this hearing today. And then exhibit two, which will start on page eight of the packet that was uploaded to OAH, will be the petition that was submitted by the petitioner, her recommendation letters, continuing education certificates, and the, de the underlying decision and order in this matter. And that would be exhibit two. All right. And then if you would please give the board a brief overview of the history of this matter. Absolutely. Uh, this matter arose through an accusation filed on November 28th, 2011. 
Petitioner entered into a stipulated settlement with the board for her license to be revoked with the revocation stayed and a four year probationary period effective April 23rd, 2012. There were five causes for discipline and then one prior citation as a disciplinary consideration. Uh, petitioner was at the time the owner and a pharmacist in charge of a pharmacy named Acton Pharmacy. That's A C T O N. In short, the violations were first, improper dispensing and furnishing of dangerous drugs on the internet. Petitioner dispensed and furnished approximately 256 prescriptions for dangerous drugs, including hydrocodone, codeine, alprazolam, diazepam, fioracet, and soma, based on prescriptions that she received via the internet, which she then shipped to patients residing in California. Petitioner paid no attention to the fact that the physicians who allegedly wrote these prescriptions were from all over the United States. The second cause for discipline was dispensing erroneous or uncertain prescriptions. Petitioner never attempted to contact any prescriber to validate the 256 prescriptions that she received and had no objective reason to believe that the prescriptions were or were not issued for any legitimate medical purpose. The third was that petitioner allowed unauthorized access to the pharmacy in that the petitioner allowed an unauthorized individual to access the supply of dangerous drugs maintained at her pharmacy. The fourth was failing to have a quality assurance program in that petitioner never developed or followed any kind of quality assurance program. And then the fifth, and there's a typographical error in the accusation, it is listed as the second fourth cause for discipline, um, but numerically it would be the fifth cause for discipline. Petitioner failed to maintain a biannual DEA inventory. Uh, when board inspectors inspected petitioner's pharmacy on May 20th of 2009, the latest DEA inventory prior to that date was completed in January of 2007, uh, two years and five months previously. Now, the citation that was considered as a disciplinary consideration was from 2008 and was for failing to practice at an acceptable standard of care. Now, this petitioner has been on probation for nearly nine years. Uh, she was ordered to serve four years. However, there was a subsequent accusation in which she agreed to extend that probation for an additional two years. So this still doesn't add up to nine years, but there have also been tolling periods due to petitioner not working as a pharmacist. Additionally, petitioner is still on probation because she has not yet complied with all of the terms and conditions of probation. Now, the two terms and conditions of probation that she has not complied with are the two terms that she is here today requesting that the board waive. So if the board were to grant petitioner's petition uh, after today's hearing, it is likely that petitioner would therefore also be terminated from probation um, because she has served sufficient time, you know, the sufficient six years in the last nine years. Uh, so it's a little bit complicated. If you have questions on that, I can try to clarify that as well. Um, so the petitioner here today is requesting that the civil penalties ordered in her matter be reduced to zero, citing extreme financial distress and an inability to pay. Uh, the civil penalties are different than cost recovery. These civil penalties were specifically for the purpose of you know, a penalty in regards to accepting these prescriptions uh, via the internet. Those civil penalties were reduced from what I believe was an original order of um, up to $6 million down to the 50,000 in the stipulated settlement. Um, so the stipulated settlement did order and petitioner agreed to pay $50,000 in civil penalties. Petitioner has paid approximately $5,250 in the last, again, nearly nine years. So she still owes over $44,000 in that civil penalty. Now, there is also a cost recovery. So in this decision that we're here for today, the petitioner was not ordered to pay cost recovery. In the subsequent decision where the probation was extended for two years, the petitioner was ordered to pay cost recovery. And that cost recovery was originally in the amount of $3,264. 
and petitioner currently has a balance of $220 of that amount remaining. So she has paid almost the entirety of that cost recovery. Petitioner here has also requested that the ethics course requirement be removed from her probation. Now, petitioner did enroll in, attend, and pay for the first part of the ethics course. Um, however, as the board may be aware, the ethics course requires two follow-ups, one at six months and one at 12 months, um, which petitioner states she simply forgot to do. So she did not complete the ethics course and cannot be considered to have satisfied that term of probation. Now, with her petition, petitioner has submitted proof of completion of approximately 31 hours of continuing education from February of 2019 through November of 2020. Petitioner has submitted five letters of recommendation and three were verified. Unfortunately, two of the letter writers never returned multiple voicemail messages from board staff. Um, so at this time, I'd like to actually move exhibit one, the uh, notice of hearing that brings us here today into evidence. All right, any objection to the notice of hearing, Ms. Uh, Mason? No, yeah. Exhibit one, the notice of hearing is admitted for jurisdictional purposes. Thank you, Your Honor. And then exhibit two would be the petition packet and all of the attachments there too, along with the consent for electronic recording. And I ask that be admitted for all purposes. Any objection to the petition package and the consent, Ms. Mason? No, Your Honor. Exhibit two is admitted. Thank you, Ms. Jarvis. I just have a, a clarifying question. I have a clarifying question with regards to the documents. So Absolutely. I did not, I did not see that second accusation and the stipulation to that second accusation in the documents. And I'm wondering, was it included? It was not. All right. And is that because that that accusation and stipulation doesn't have to do with the the matters that are being requested to be reduced and or eliminated as part of the probation? That's exactly right, Your Honor. So right. the terms that Ms. Mason is requesting be removed are solely in this case, the case number 4207. The other case simply extended the probation two years and added the cost recovery, uh, which is not an issue here. All right, understood. Thank you for the clarification. Anything further before I swear in Ms. Mason? Nope, I will turn the floor over to the petitioner. Thank you. All right, Ms. Mason, the first thing I need to do is swear you in. So if you would please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you give in this matter will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do, Your Honor. Please state and spell your name. My name is Hannah Mason, H-A-N-N-A-H, -N -N Mason, M-A-S-O-N. All right, Ms. Mason, as I explained before, this is your opportunity to provide the board any information you want them to consider for purposes of issuing their decision concerning your petition and request. Um, just please remember to keep your voice up and speak slowly so that we can all hear you. Um, and then as I mentioned before, Ms. Jarvis will have an opportunity to question you after you're done testifying. Sometimes um, you may forget things while you're testifying, but once uh, Ms. Jarvis asks you some questions, you may remember additional things. And after the board questions you all, make sure you have uh, one last opportunity to provide any testimony that you wish. All right, are you ready to begin? Yes, I am, Your Honor. All right, then you may begin. My name is Hannah Mason, and um, my pharmacy is licensed and was put on probation uh, back in 2012 when I own the act of the pharmacy. I want, I want the, the court to know that apart from the, the situation that was going on with the state board, there were other issues in my life that had actually um, compounded during the whole situation. And one of them was, I was going through a contentious uh, divorce and, uh, and um, that wasn't in my favor, so. Um, a lot of things that happened during that time, and um, I had lost my home, and um, and I was uh, living in my car for a little bit, and then I moved. Um, I moved to Blythe, and stayed with the family, um, and started working um, at the prison there, um, and. Uh, 
that's where I that's why I was contacted with the, by the boards and uh, I I had lost the job there because of this situation because I was on the there and um, there was just a lot going on at that time I was being sued by by my ex and ex partners of the pharmacy and uh, I have my children to take care of also. I finally got a job out here um, with Biaset Pharmacy. And of course, because of this situation, um, they were able to take me in, but, you know, I wasn't getting paid. Uh, you know, uh, they knew that's the situation. So um, it's just been difficult to have it's been hard for me to keep up with um, my payments with the boards and things. There's a lot of distraction, a lot of things going on. And now that it's intentional that I don't want to pay, it's just, it's just been difficult. I'm 60 years old or 61, actually. And, uh, you know, I seem to be 62 next, next August. And, it's just I just don't see a way out in terms of you know, paying this off or trying to study and thinking about uh, retirement and that kind of stuff because everything was lost. Everything I had was lost during school. Miss Mason, um, you're cutting out a bit. I'm not sure if there's any way to get a little closer to the microphone, but your some of your words were I'm losing, so I want to make sure that we that the board can hear you and that I can hear you, Ms. Jarvis. So, just to the extent that you can get as close as possible to that microphone, that will help. Can you hear me better now? Yes, that's better. Yes. Thank you. So I was just saying, it's just been a difficult time for me, and um, you know, time does go by fast. Already, it's been nine years. But I still haven't been able to get myself, you know, um, situated financially to to really get rid of this, so I can get a better job for the next five years, so I can retire with some type of, you know, retirement or anything like that. Because as it, as it speaks right now, as it stands right now, I'm only working fifteen hours mm -hmm. um, at the at um, Heritage Pharmacy. Uh, he took me in at 25, but he claims he's not making any money. So I'm bound to be verified with my family. My Miss Mason, we lost yes. you there. So so you were you were hired to work 25 hours a week, but your hours were reduced to 15 hours a week. Is that correct? Yes, within the past month. Okay, and then what were you saying after that? I was just saying that um, I'm hoping that I can get out of probation so I can get a, a decent job because anybody that sees um, the thing of my license, you know, I'm not, I'm not hireable. So I get to go to uh, seek, you know, employment with, with um, you know, um, independent stores that um, a don't want to hire me because because of the situation. If they do hire me, it would be with less wage wages, which you know I'm obligated to take because I have no other choice. But um, it's just been it's just been a really difficult situation for me financially with my two children. I'm a single mom, and uh, it's just been a difficult time for me. So that, like I said, I years old and uh, 61 years old and uh, you know I'm soon to enter retirement with, with actually really nothing so I'm, I'm pleading with the boards to to help me uh, get 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 this behind me so I can at least get you know maybe a few more years in the workforce with a decent paying job so I can please retire. So 
Ms. Mason, I'm going to now allow Ms. Jarvis to ask you some questions. Ms. Jarvis, do you have any questions for Ms. Mason? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Uh, and I'm going to take these in reverse order. So you were just speaking of your children. Your children are adults now, right? Approximately 18 and 21? Um, yes. Yes, they just what they just graduated from college. And then in your petition packet, you provided a personal statement. And one of the things that seemed to uh, be frustrating to you was that you enrolled in the pharmacist recovery program. And you said that you were never involved with drugs, either legal or illegal. Um, but are you aware that the pharmacist recovery program is not only for substance issues? It can also help with mental health issues or therapy or other issues that you may have in your life? No, yeah, no, but I, I'm not aware of that. But what I had gone through with Maximus was was pretty, um, I have to say, devastating. And the fact that, you know, I have to take a P-test every so often, taking out of work, uh, you know, urinate in front of people watching you and things. And I, in my opinion, I just thought that was, it had to be meant for people that are on drugs. And all the, all the tests that were taken were never, nothing was positive. So did you gain anything from the mental health part of that program? From the therapy that you any, went to? I'm not going to, you know, I'm not, I wasn't going to, no, to be honest with you, I'm going to be very honest now. Because um, I was meant to go, I, you know, I was sent to like AA meetings and and it would just, it affected me a little bit. And, you know, I'm, I'm not on drugs. I never attempted to take drugs. The whole thing, I never did any of that. Now, looking at your other case, um, it sounds like your other case was essentially wholesaling without a license in that you sold the drugs that you'd had in your pharmacy to another pharmacy without keeping the records. Is that right? But that was a little confusing to me because I had no idea that, you know, I know ignorance of the law is no excuse, but the I was closing the pharmacy and I thought the right thing to do was to to set, send the inventory to another pharmacy. But again, like I said, you know, this was all new. I learned a lot in the pharmacy business doing all of that. I didn't know that that was against the law. I mean, just I transferred all the, um, the inventory that was left in the pharmacy to, to uh, uh, as a drugs. And also, again, like I said, I was in partnership with another, with, with another non-pharmacist uh, partner. And that case was in court also. And the I was um, mandated to turn over the pharmacy to that person by the judge, which was, yeah, this was a really, um, so no, hold on. Just Miss Miss Jarvis, hold on just a second. Miss Miss Mason, I can yes. see you talking, but I can't hear what you're saying. So you're cutting out again. I'm not I'm sure. There's, so you were ordered to sell the pharmacy or transfer the pharmacy to someone. I was ordered to turn over the pharmacy to my partner. Okay. So so what I did was to because there were control items and things and I know this other part the partner doesn't have um, a pharmacy license or anything like that it was really a really complex situation so I'd gone in and secured that all this inventory and gave it to and sent it to desert drugs it was in there and I gave that to him because I knew um, that was going to be in the in the hands of non it was a really complex situation, so and and that's what I did. But again, like I said, I thought that was the right thing to do, but um, it turned out that it wasn't. 
And just for the record, Your Honor, that case number was 3919 or 3919, and it is available on the public website, Breeze, uh, for licensees. Um, Ms. Mason, if you were to be granted your petition and ultimately be terminated from probation, would you be looking to get back into ownership of a pharmacy in the future? Absolutely not, Ms. Jeff. Why not? Why not? I learned a lot during, I mean, it's a multifaceted um, business and um, there's no way I can, I can, you know. Can you, can you repeat that? I said it's a multifaceted business. Um, it's highly regulated and, and no, I, I, I don't know what I was thinking going into it initially. <laughs> I don't think, no, I will never be in, in owning a pharmacy anymore. And if it were offered to you, would you accept a position as a pharmacist in charge? I may, being in that, you know, what I know now, um, you know, I, I still think I have some leadership skills and, you know, and a lot of things. Um, when I was working at Fireside Pharmacy, there are a lot of things that I would bring up to the owners and other pharmacists, you know, to make them aware of, you know, the laws and, and you know, through my experience and you know, a lot of things I would. So if if I am asked, I I don't see, I don't think I'll have any problems taking that position. Okay, thank you. I have no other questions at this time. All right, I'm now going to ask our board members if they have any questions, starting with our uh, with board president. Any questions for Ms. Mason? Yes, actually I'm confused about a couple of things. Uh, I don't understand why, why you were given the PRP either. Um, that, why was it expressed to you that you were, that? The PRP was part of your uh, judgment, your discipline. Oh, can you repeat that, please? I'm so sorry. Okay. Why? Why? Why is it your understanding that you were given uh, PRP as part of your discipline? I don't understand it either. Well, this is this is the thing. When when um, my license was revoked. Got in touch with, or the attorney general got in touch with me. Um, I was given, oh, you know, I was given the stipulation, and the honest truth was, I didn't even understand that part. I just, I didn't know how serious that was. That was all included in it, but I had no idea what it entailed. So what I, they, they wanted me to look through it. And if there's anything I, dis I disputed, um, I should go back to them and tell them. So what you, I, you don't know why they put it in there? No, not at all. Okay, the other, the other thing, um, based on what I read, the prescriptions that uh, you uh, filled online, there were 256 of them. And based on what you had said, what you were you made um, like five dollars per prescription, right? Is that correct? That you there you about received there there about yes. Okay, so that's less than uh, you know a couple thousand dollars, I guess, um, or less than five anyway. So I don't understand. You said that. Uh, additionally, that the uh, the amount of money you were told to pay was one point two million. Ms. Jarvis said it was six million. Um, was it ever six million? No, yeah, no, Mr. Greg, no. Okay. It ever it was one point two? That was reduced to fifty thousand. Um, but even that, that sounds extremely high for the fact that you were enriched by such a small amount. I, I'm, I understand it's punitive because what you did was, was wrong. Um, but do you have any idea why they 
that a, that amount? Good question. I guess um, probably because of um, the theoretical uh, mathematics. I'm not too sure. To be honest with you, I'm not. Um, but no, it was never that amount, and I never, I never made that kind of. Okay. What well, you signed a stipulation that agreed to these things. Um, you must have had some belief that that stipulation was proper. Um, exactly. Exactly. Okay. But, uh, and I would go ahead. I'm sorry. I would cer certainly caution you, but if if you do get your license back, I would certainly caution you against accepting a PIC position. That's uh, fine, yes, Mr. Fay. Um, I guess that's really it for me. All right. Did Miss Did Miss Beal join the? Is she on this call? No. All right this then. Um, our right next then. Um, all right then. Uh, Dr. Serpa, do you have any questions for the petitioner for Miss Mason? Yes. Thank you. I have a couple of questions. Thank you, Miss Mason. Uh, I. I can hear in your testimony um, how difficult this process has been for you in uh, your family uh, and where you are now. Um, and you know it is uh, difficult for us to hear those comments also. But as uh, a public board, um, what I'm really interested in hearing is and how you have changed and what you have learned through this process that you would be different if you were to have your pharmacist license uh, uh, conditions terminated. Uh, what have you learned through this? How would you be different? Um, and then also if you could remark at the end as to why you didn't complete the ethics course um, and how that should be handled by the board. Well, um, thank you for giving me the opportunity. Um, to express myself. Um, I have learned a lot. And um, during the time when um, the, the when I had the pharmacy, I did have a few um, other pharmacy owners um, that I collaborated with when this opportunity came um, to, to um, fill those prescriptions. But now I have learned that I should have done the, the due diligence but and not depend on other people. And and um, again, like I said, I worked at Fireside Pharmacy and I've always been the the lookout person and you know, so to speak, and and know the the you know, I know the 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 implications of what would happen if um you know, um, the wrong prescription gets in the wrong hands. So I've changed in that sense, and we can we can verify that with, with uh, people that I've worked with. I don't fill any prescriptions that look, you know, um, putting I out of the area. Um, I do my due diligence. I call. I look up the the doctor's uh, information on the website, and uh, make sure do not fill this type of prescription. So in that way, I'm, I'm very alert um, in terms of, you know, complying with the law and just you know, making sure everything is done. Good. So, and the second question. Oh, the ethics course. Actually, I, for some reason, I didn't, I went to the ethics course uh, the three days, um, to three week, three days in the weekend, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and um, and I, I sincerely thought I finished. You know, I didn't know that I had anything else to do. I paid, I paid the money. It was over three thousand dollars at that, and I went. You know, I went, and I learned a lot from it. So the decision that I have. Out the six months and the twelve months, there's a lot. There was a lot going on at that time too, like you said, you know. So, Miss Mason, I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. So, so you said that you completed the first part, 
and you what you didn't know that you needed to return? I didn't think I had to return. I think it was a questionnaire that we sent after the six months that I had to to fill out, which you know I I didn't know I had to. She she may have sent it to me, um, but I'm going to be quite honest. I didn't I didn't receive it, or I I don't remember um, I'm filling it out. I didn't have to go back to San Diego to do the course again in six months. It's just, I think, a, a follow-up questionnaire that was sent to me that I missed and didn't know I had to follow up with that. I'm not too sure if I'm making uh, uh, it. Miss, Miss, are you done with your questions? I'm sorry. Yes, thanks, Your Honor. No more questions. All right. Mr. Brooks, any questions for Miss Mason? Uh, no questions, Your Honor. Thank you. All right. And uh, Ms. Butler, any questions for Ms. Mason? Um, just to follow up on, um, on the question that was just posed to you about the ethics co course, uh, would you have any problem completing that? Well, it actually has been completed um, because I think the board contacted um, the organization that that does it and they sent they sent me the completion uh, form which i did okay taken that should have been taken okay. miss mason i'm sorry let me can i just clarify so you believe that you've actually completed everything you needed to complete yes actually it has been done did you submit that as part of your of your petition package I believe I did the last time. But do you do you have the petition package in front of you? Not that one, no. But it's it's in my email. So she sent it to me, and I actually did send it to um, Inspector Smith. Miss Jarvis, do you know the document that Miss Mason is talking about? I do not, Your Honor. Have you received anything indicating that Ms. Mason has completed the ethics course? No, the uh, evidence that we have and the documents that we have are that she completed the first part, but she failed to do the six month and the 12 month follow up. So, I mean, as far as we're the board, I mean, board staff in their records, they do not have any record of her completing the six month or the 12 month. And in fact, in Ms. Mason's petition, she states that she forgot to do the follow-up. Um, so I'm not really sure what she's referring to. No, the reason I said that, I'm so sorry. Can I speak? Yes, please. Please explain, Ms. Mason. Yes. I forgot to do it, but when I sent in, when I sent in my petition, um, the board contacted um, the organization to see if it was completed. I think that's when that um, lady had said that it was, it wasn't, I guess they were trying to get in touch with me or they had sent in an email. And so she sent that to me during that time. I during, um, sent to me and I filled it out and sent it back to her. And then she sent uh, confirmation that it's been it's been completed. So, and when did you receive that confirmation, Miss Mason? So I was I was um, I was scheduled almost scheduled for the last hearing, but I guess there were so many things outstanding that I didn't make it. So it had to be just before the last hearing that you had. And you submitted that information to the board. I did. And when was that? That was around that time because they were trying to get me in to to be to be heard um, the last time. But I can I can find I can look through my email. I'm so sorry. I can look through my emails, and I think I sent it to my board inspector. Also, I think I did, Doctor Samari, because she had called me to ask me. How come I didn't read it? 
So we will go back from four of that you can send me uh, to perform. All right, Ms. Butler, do you have any additional questions for Ms. Mason? No, I just, you know, would like to just make sure uh, that, um, you know, that there is definitely a need to verify uh, that the ethics course was um, completed. And I'm just sorry to hear that you lost your home your, um, and living in your car and uh, all of those things. And um, especially under the circumstances of, of nine years after making a bad choice and um, feeling like the DE numbers of prescribing doctors on file was, was, you know, something that made you feel that you were doing the right thing in this, in this whole um, choice that you made. So that's it. All right, Ms. Kim, do you have any questions for Ms. Mason? Uh, no, Your Honor. All right. Uh, Dr. O, do you have any questions for Ms. Mason? I don't have any questions. Thank you. All right. Mr. Patel, any questions? No questions. Thank you. Mr. Sanchez, any questions? Uh, no questions. Mr. Weiss, any questions? No questions, Your Honor. All right. Um, is there anything further that, oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Wong, any questions? Dr. I'm Wong. I'm sorry, what was that? No question, please. All right. Uh, all right, Ms. Mason, is there anything else you would like to add? Um, just, um, Your Honor, just to add that um, I did learn a lot from my mistakes, and it's been a really costly mistake. And um, I just hope, you know, you will find it in your hearts to give me a chance to. Ms. Jarvis, are you there? I'm sorry, I'm not seeing you. Uh, yes, I'm here, Your Honor. Sorry, I, my, I've been having some technical difficulties, so I am back. <laughs> All right, would you wish to give any closing remarks? Um, so, Your Honor, I actually, I have a suggestion. I've reached out to Ms. Mason's probation monitor to clarify this information about the ethics course. So I can make closing remarks and we can submit, but then if Ms. Mason could hang on the line until I hear back, uh, we can take another petition and then come back to her if that, if we need to clarify that. Um, well, we're not gonna submit because once it's submitted, the record is closed. And so um, uh, one option is it's 1215. Um, I suspect that the board will be taking a lunch break. Um, I'm not sure about that. I'm gonna defer to the board president, but if there is a lunch break coming up, one option is to uh, take a recess for lunch and then come back. And if you have that information, or you need to call a, win a witness to clarify for the board that that is an option. Um, so I'll ask our board president um, with regards to yes. scheduling if, if that's a possibility. Yes, we will do that. All right, so then um, I will just then turn it over to you with regards to how long uh, the lunch break is gonna be. And then what we'll do is we'll reconvene then after lunch. And then uh, Ms. Jarvis, if there's anything, any further evidence to present that can be done at that time. And if there's not, then the closing remarks can be given and the matter can be submitted and the record will be closed. Okay, and then your honor, may I ask Ms. Mason, what were the dates that you completed the follow-up and what is the name of the person that you say you submitted your information to? Okay, the dates I'm not too sure. I'm gonna go on to my, um, email and look for it and um and her name is lynette or leanne leanne is her name the the lady with your and the with the um course her name is leanne but i will find it i will find it and uh, send it to inspector samara no so miss mason the question just to so we're clear miss jarvis is asking who at the board did you submit the information to you said that you submitted the information to your probation monitor. Is that correct? That's my, I'm pretty sure I did. You know, I don't want to. Yes, I think I did. And who is your probation monitor? I have it. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Who is your probation monitor? Inspector Samantha. Did you, do you, did you hear that, Ms. Jarvis? Um, the last name was, is it Samar? Samari. 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 
Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so Your Honor, it's 12.15. Why don't we reconvene at one o'clock? All right, then we are uh, gonna be off the record then in this hearing. Please, Ms. Mason, Ms. Jarvis be back at one o'clock. And at that time, Ms. Jarvis, if there's a witness or evidence to present with regards to this issue, you can do so at that time. Likewise, Ms. Mason, if there's anything with regards to this issue that you discover that you would like to present to the board, you can do that at one when we come back. That's fine, Your Honor. Thank right, you, Thank Anna. you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, is our moderator here? Hello, this is the moderator. Hi. Okay, we're going to take a lunch break and return at 1 p.m. Great, thank you. I'll go ahead thank and you. pause the recording. Thank you. And just as a reminder to board members, if you could please mute your microphone and turn off your camera during the break.